Hello everyone, and welcome back to The Ring. Well, really, Ring by Koji Suzuki, the book behind the infamous movie series. Uh, we should be finishing it today, possibly. It might be a little longer of a read than the last couple. Uh, thanks for joining us, Xavier, Lopsel, Don, Delvin, Jeff. Uh, we stopped last time with our, our heroes, if you want to call them that. Um, on an island investigating the character, the uh, ghost that's haunting them. They are trapped on the island because of a typhoon. Uh, our main detective, Asakawa, is worried because his wife and child are now also wrapped up in all this. But they are getting closer and closer to solving the mystery of who's behind the creepy murder tape. So here we are, chapter 8 of section 3. Investigate. What is it exactly I should investigate about this woman? She joined the troop in 65? You've got to be kidding. That's 25 years ago. Yoshino was ranting to himself. It's hard enough to trace a criminal's steps years after the fact, but 25? We need anything and everything you can find out. We want to know what kind of life this woman's led, what she's doing right now, what she wants. Yoshino could only sigh. He wedged the receiver between his ear and his shoulder and pulled a notepad over from the edge of the desk. And how old was she at the time? Eighteen. She graduated from high school on Oshima and went straight to Tokyo, where she joined a theater group called Theater Group Soaring. Oshima? Yoshino stopped writing and frowned. Where are you calling from, anyway? From a place called Sashikiji on Izu Oshima Island. And when do you plan on coming back? As soon as I can. You realize there's a typhoon heading your way. Of course, there was no way Asakawa could be ignorant of it, being right there in the middle of it. But to Yoshino, the whole thing had taken on an unreal quality that he had begun to find amusing. The deadline was the ne night after next, and yet Asakawa himself was holed up on Ashima, possibly unable to escape. Have you heard any travel advisories? Asakawa still didn't know many details. Well, I'm not sure, but the way it looks now, I imagine they'll be grounding all flights and suspending ocean transport. Asakawa had been too busy chasing down Sadako Yamamura to pick up any reliable information about the typhoon. He'd had a bad feeling ever since stepping onto the Oshima Pier, but now that the pos excuse me, now that the possibility of being stranded here had been voiced, he suddenly felt a sense of urgency. Receiver still in hand, he fell silent. Hey, don't don't worry. They they haven't canceled anything yet. Yoshino tried to sound positive. Then he changed the subject. So, this woman, Sadako Yamamura, you've checked her history out up to the age of 18. More or less, Asakawa answered, conscious of the sound of the wind and waves outside the phone booth. This isn't your only lead, right? You've got to have something besides this theater group soaring. Nope, that's it. Sadako Yamamura, born in Sashikiji on Izu Oshima Island in 1947, to Shizuko Yamamura. Hey, make a note of that name. Shizuko Yamamura. She was 22 and 47. She left her new baby with her grandmother and ran off to Tokyo. Why'd she leave the baby on the island? There was a man. Make a note of this, too. Heihachiro Ikuma. At the time, he was assistant professor of psychiatry. He was also Shizuko Yamamura's lover. Does that mean Sadako is Shizuko and Ikuma's child? I haven't been able to find proof, but I think it's safe to assume that. They weren't married, right? Exactly. Heihachiro Ikuma already had a family. So, it had been an illicit affair. Yoshino licked the tip of his pencil. Okay, I'm with you. Go on. Early in 1950, Shizuko suddenly revisits her hometown for the first time in three years. She's reunited with her daughter Sadako and lives there for a while. But by the end of the year, she's absconded again, this time taking Sadako with her. For the next five years, nobody knows where Shizuko and Sadako are or what they're doing. But in the mid-50s, Shizuko's cousin, still living on the island, hears a rumor that Shizuko has become famous doing something or other. Was she involved in some sort of incident? It's unclear. The cousin just says he started hearing things about Shizuko through the grapevine, but when I gave him my card, he saw I worked for a newspaper and said, if you're a reporter, you probably know more about it than me. 
From the way he was talking, it sounds like from about 1950 to 55, Shizuko and Sadako were involved in something that caused a stir in the media. But the news from the mainland was hard to come by on the island. So you'd like me to check and see what got in on the news? You read my mind. Idiot. It was obvious. There's more. In 56, Shizuko comes back to the island, dragging Sadako with her. The mother's so worn down, she looks like a different person, and she won't answer any of her cousin's questions. She just closes up, mumbling incoherently. And then one day, she throws herself into Mount Mihara, the volcano, and kills herself. She was 31. So I'm also finding out why Shizuko committed suicide, if you would. Still holding the receiver, Asakawa bowed. If he ended up stranded on this island, Yoshino would be his only hope. Asakawa regretted that both he and Ryuji had so blithely come here. Ryuji could have easily investigated a little hammock like Sashikiji all by himself. It would have been more efficient for Asakawa to stay in Tokyo and wait for Ryuji to contact him, and then team up with Yoshino to check things out on that end. All right, I'll see what I can, but I think I'm a little understaffed here. I'll call Oguri to s ask him and send some people your way. That'd be great. It was one thing to say it, of course, but Asakawa didn't have much confidence in the idea. His editor was always complaining about being short-handed. Asakawa seriously doubted he'd spare valuable manpower for something like this. So, her mother kills herself. Sadako stays on in Sashikiji, taken care of by her mother's cousin. That cousin's turned his house into a bread and bed and breakfast now. He was about to say that he and Ryuji were staying in that very house, but decided it was an unnecessary detail. The following year, Sadako, who's a fourth grader now, makes a name for herself at school by predicting the eruption of Mount Mihara. Did you get that? Mount Mihara erupted in 57, on the very day and time Sadako had predicted. Now that's impressive. If we had a woman like that, we wouldn't need the Coordinating Committee for Earthquake Prediction. As a result of her prediction coming true, her fame spread throughout the island and was picked up by Professor Miura's network. But Asakawa figured he didn't need to explain all that. What was important now was... After that, the islanders kept coming to Sadako, asking her to predict their futures, but she turned down every single request. She just kept saying she didn't have that kind of power. Out of modesty? Who knows? Then, when she finishes high school, she takes off for Tokyo, just like she couldn't get away. The relatives who'd been taking care of her got exactly one postcard from her. It said she'd passed the test and been accepted into theater group Soaring. They haven't heard from her again to this day. There's not a soul on the island who knows where she is or what she's up to. In other words, the only clue we have, the only trace she left, is this theater group Soaring. I'm afraid so. Okay, let me make sure I have this straight. What I'm supposed to find out is what Shizuko Yamamura was in the news for, why she jumped into a volcano, and where her daughter went and what she did after joining a theater troupe at age 18. In other words, all about the mother and all about the daughter. Just those two things. Right. Which first? Huh? I'm asking you whether you want me to start with the mother or daughter. You don't have much time left, you know. The most pressing issue, clearly, was what had become of Sadako. Could you start with the daughter? Gotcha. I guess first thing tomorrow I'll pop into the office of theater group Soaring. Asakawa looked at his watch. It was only a little past six in the evening, still plenty of time before a rehearsal space would be closing. Yoshino, not tomorrow. Say you'll do it tonight. Yoshino heaved a sigh and shook his head slightly. Now look, Asakawa, I have my own work to do, you know. Did you think of that? I've got a mountain of things I've got to write up in the morning. Even tomorrow's a little... Yoshino trailed off. If he said anything more, it would look like he was trying to make Asakawa feel too much in his debt. He always took the greatest care to appear manly in situations like this. Please, I'm begging you. I mean, my deadline is the day after tomorrow. He knew how things worked in their business, and he was afraid to put it any more strongly. All he could do was wait quietly for Yoshino's decision. But, ah, what the hell. I'll try and get it to you tonight, but I'm not making any promises, mind you. <sighs> Thanks, I owe you. Asakawa bowed and started to hang up. Hey, hang on a second. There's something important I haven't asked you yet. What's that? What possible relationship could there be between what you saw in the video and Sadako Yamamura? Asakawa paused. You wouldn't believe me even if I told you. Try me. No video camera recorded those images. Asakawa paused for a good long moment to allow his meaning to sink into Yoshino's brain. 
Those images are things Sadako saw with her eyes, things she imagined in her head, fragments presented one after another with nothing to contextualize them. Huh? Yoshino was momentarily at a loss for words. See, I told you you wouldn't believe it. You mean they're like psychic photos? The phrase doesn't even begin to cover it. She actually caused the images to appear on a TV. She's projecting moving images on a TV. So what, she's a production agency? Yoshino laughed at his own joke. Asakawa didn't get angry. He understood why Yoshino had to joke. He listened silently to his friend's carefree laughter. 9.40 p.m. As he climbed the stairs out of Yotsuya Sanchome Station on the Marunochi subway line, a gust of wind threatened to blow Yoshino's hat off, and he had to hold it down on his head with both hands. He looked around him for the fire station he was supposed to use as a landmark. It was right there on the corner. A minute's walk down the street took him to his destination. A sign stood on the sidewalk reading theater group soaring. Next to it, a flight of stairs led down to a basement, from the depths of which came the voices of young men and women, raised in mingled singing and recitation. They probably had a performance coming up and were planning to rehearse until the train stopped running. He didn't have to be an arts reporter to figure that out, but he spent most of his time chasing after crime stories. He had to admit it felt a little weird visiting the rehearsal space of a Pretori theater company. The stairs to the basement were made of steel, and every step clanged. If the founding members of the company had no recollection of Sadako Yamamura, the thread would snap, and that psychic's life on which all their hopes rested would sink back into the darkness. Theater group Sadako had... Sadako. Theater group Soaring had been founded in 1957, and Sadako had joined in 65. There were only four founding members still around today, including a guy named Yuchimura, a playwright and director who spoke for the group. Yoshino gave his card to a twenty-something intern standing at the entrance to the rehearsal hall and asked him to call Uchimura. "'You have a visitor from the Daily News, sir?' The intern spoke in a resonant, actorly voice, calling to the director, who sat by the wall watching over everyone's performances. Uchimura turned around in surprise. Realizing his visitor was from the press, he was all smiles as he approached Yoshino. Theater companies all treated the press with great politeness. Even the smallest mention in the newspaper's arts column could make a big difference in ticket sales. With only a week left until opening night, he assumed the reporter had come to take a peek at the rehearsals. The Daily News had never paid much attention to him before, so Ichimura poured on the charm, determined to make the most of the chance. But the minute he learned the real reason for Yoshino's visit, Uchimura abruptly seemed to lose all interest in him. Suddenly, he was extremely busy. He looked around the hall until he spied a smallish actor in his fifties seated on a chair. Over here, Shin, he said in a shrill voice, summoning the man. Something in the overly familiar tone he used when addressing the middle-aged actor, or maybe it was his womanish voice itself, combined with his ungainly long arms and legs, gave the brawny Yoshino the creeps. This guy is different, he thought. <laughs> okay. Shin, baby, you don't go on until the second act. Be a dear and talk to this man about Sadako Yamamura. You remember the creepy girl, don't you? Shin's voice was one Yoshino had heard before, dubbing Japanese dialogue onto Western movies shown on TV. Shin Arima was better known as a voice actor than for his work on stage. He was one of the other original members still in the troupe. Sadako Yamamura... Arima scratched his balding head as he tried to reel in quarter-century-old memories. Oh, that's Sadako Yamamura, he grimaced. Evidently the woman had left a deep impression on him. You remember? Well then, I'm rehearsing here, so take him up to my room, won't you? Uchimura bowed slightly and walked back toward the assembled players. By the time he reached the place where he'd be s been sitting, he was once more every inch the lordly director. Opening a door marked President, Arima pointed to a leather, leather sofa set and said, Have a seat. If this was the President's office, it meant that the troupe was organized like a business. No doubt the director doubled as CEO. So what brings you out in the middle of a storm like this? Arima's face glistened red with sweat from rehearsing, but a kindly smile lurked in the depths of his eyes. The director looked like the type of person who was always weighing the other's motives while conversing, but Arima was the kind of guy who answered everything you asked him honestly, without covering anything up. Interviews could be either easy or painful, depending on the subject's personality. "'I'm sorry to bother you when you're so busy like this,' Yoshino sat down and took out his notepad. 
He assumed his usual pose, pen clutched in his right hand. I never expected to hear the name Sadako Yamamura. Not now. That was ages ago. Arima was recalling his youth. He missed the youthful energy he'd had then, running away from the commercial theater company he'd originally belonged to. Oh, excuse me, the sneezes came up suddenly. <sighs> running away from the commercial theater company he'd originally belonged to and founding a new troupe with his friends. <sniffs> Mr. Arima, when you said her name a few minutes ago, you said that Sadako Yamamura. What exactly did you mean by that? That girl, let me see. When was it she joined anyway? I believe we'd only been around a few years. The company was really taking off then, and we had more kids wanting to join every year. Anyway, that's Sadako. She was a strange one. In what way was she strange? Hmm. Arima put his hand to his jaw and thought for a while. Come to think of it, why do I have the impression she's strange? Was there something in particular about her, something that stood out? No, to look at her, she was an ordinary girl, a little tall but quiet. She was always alone. Alone? Well, usually the interns become quite close to each other, but she never tried to get involved with the others. There was always someone like that in any group. It was hard for Yoshino to imagine that this alone had her standing out. How would you describe her in a word? In a word? Hmm. Eerie, I'd have to say. Without hesitation, he called her Eerie, and Uchimura had called her that creepy girl. Yoshino couldn't help but feel sorry for a young woman of eighteen whom everybody characterized as eerie. He was beginning to imagine some grotesque figure of a woman. <sniffs> what was it about her that made her seem eerie? Now that he stopped to think on it, it seemed odd to Arima that his impressions of an intern who'd been around for no longer than a year, twenty-five years ago at that, should still seem so fresh. There was something tugging at the back of his mind. Something had happened. Something that had served to fix her name in his memory. Oh, yes. Now I remember. It was right in this room. Arima looked around the president's office. Thinking back on the incident, he could vivid... Excuse me. He could vividly recall even how the furniture had been arranged in those days, when this room was still being used as the main office. You see, we've rehearsed in this space since the beginning, but it used to be a lot smaller. This room we're in now used to be our main office. There were lockers over there, and we had a frosted glass divider standing about here. Right, and there used to be a TV right there. Well, we have a different one now. Arima pointed as he spoke. A TV? Yoshino narrowed his eyes and adjusted his grip on his pen. Right, one of those old black and white jobs. Okay, so what happened? Yoshino urged him to go on. Rehearsal had just ended, and nearly everybody had gone home. I wasn't happy with one of my lines, and I came up here to go over my part one more time. I was right over there, see? Arima pointed to the door. I was standing there, looking into the room, and through the frosted glass I could see the TV screen flickering. I thought, well, someone's watching TV. Mind you, I wasn't mistaken. It was on the other side of the divider, so I couldn't actually see what was on the screen. But I could see the quavering black and white light. There was no sound. The room was dim, and as I came around the divider, I wondered who was in front of the TV, and I peered at the person's face. It was Sadako Yamamura. But when I came around to the other side of the divider and stood beside her, there was nothing on the screen. Of course, I automatically assumed she'd just switched it off. At that point, I had no doubts yet. But... Arima seemed reluctant to continue. Please, go on. I spoke to her. I said you'd better hurry home before the train stopped running, and I turned on the desk lamp. But it wouldn't turn on. I looked and saw it wasn't plugged in. I crouched down to plug it in, and that's when I noticed the television wasn't plugged in either. Arima vividly recalled the chill that had run up his spine when he saw the plug lying there on the floor. <sniffs> Yoshino wanted to confirm what he'd heard. So even though it wasn't plugged in, the television was definitely on? That's right. It made me shudder. Let me tell you. I raised my head without thinking and looked at Sadako. What was she doing, sitting there in front of an unplugged television set? She didn't meet my gaze, but just kept staring at the screen with a faint smile on, my li on her lips. Arima seemed to remember the smallest detail. The op episode had obviously made a deep impression on him. Did you tell anyone about this? Naturally. I told Uchi, that is, Uchimura, the director, whom you've met, and also Sh Shigemori. Shigemori? He was the real founder of the company. Uchimura is actually our second leader. Ah, so did Mr. Shigemori react to your story? 
He was playing Mahjong at the time, but he was fascinated. He always did have a weakness for women, and it seemed he'd had his eye on her for a while, planning to make her his. That evening, after he'd had a few, he started talking crazy, saying, "'Tonight I'm going to storm Sadako's apartment.' We didn't know what to do. It was just drunken babbling. We couldn't take it too seriously, but we couldn't go along with it either. After a while, everybody went home and Shigemori was left alone, and in the end, we never knew if he actually went to Sadako's apartment that night or not. But the next day, when Shigemori showed up at rehearsal, he looked completely different. He was pale and silent, and he just sat in his chair, saying absolutely nothing. And then he died, right there, just like going to sleep. Startled, Yoshino looked up. What was the cause of death? Cardiac paralysis. Today they'd call it sudden heart failure, I guess. He was pushing himself pretty hard to get ready for premiere, and I think he just overdid it. So basically nobody knows if something happened between Sadako and Shigemori. Yoshino pressed the point, and Narima gave a definite nod. No wonder she'd left such a strong impression, Yoshino thought. What happened to her after that? She quit. I think she was only with us for a year or two. And then what did she do after she quit? I'm afraid I can't help you there. What do most people do when they quit the troupe? People who are really dedicated try to join another company. Do you think Sadako Yamamura might have done that? She was a bright girl, and her acting instincts weren't bad at all. But she had such personality defects. I mean, this business is all about personal relationships. I don't think she was really cut out for it. So you're saying there's a possibility she left the theater world altogether? I really couldn't say. Is there anybody who might know what happened to her? Maybe one of the other interns who was here at the time. Would you happen to have any of their names and addresses? Hmm, hold on. Arima stood up and walked over to the shelves built into the wall. Bound files were lined up from one end of the shelf to the other. He took one down. It contained the portfolios applicants submitted when they took the entrance exam. Including her, there were eight interns who joined in 65. He waved the portfolios in the air. May I have a look? Go right ahead. Each portfolio had two photos attached, a headshot and body shot. Trying to remain calm, Yoshino pulled out Sadako Yamamura's portfolio. He looked at her photos. Hey, didn't you say she was eerie a few minutes ago? Yoshino was confused. There was too much of a gap between the Sadako he'd imagined from Arima's description and the Sadako in the photos. Eerie? You've got to be kidding me. I've never seen such a pretty face. Yoshino wondered why he'd phrased it that way, why he'd said pretty face instead of pretty girl. Certainly, her facial features were perfectly regular, but she lacked a certain womanly roundness. But looking at the full-body photo, he had to admit her slender waist and ankles were strikingly feminine. She was beautiful, and yet the passage of twenty-five years had corroded their impressions of her until they remembered her as eerie, as that creepy girl. Normally, they should have recalled her as a wonderfully beautiful young woman. Yoshino's interest was piqued by this eeriness that seemed to elbow out the salient prettiness of her face. Okay, one sec. I'm going to continue my snack. Uh, unfortunately, I've had a bit of an episode today, so I, I made some eggs. Let's see if they'll help. Standing at the intersection of Omote Sando and Oyama Dori, Yoshino once more took out his notebook. 6-1 Minami Oyama, Sugiyama Lodgings. That had been Sadako's address 25 years before. The address had him worried. He followed Omote Sando as it curved, and sure enough, the 6-1 was the block opposite the Nezu Museum, one of the more upmarket districts in the city. Just as he'd feared, there was nothing but imposing red brick condos where the cheap Sugoyami lodging should have been. Who were you kidding, anyway? How are you supposed to follow this woman's tracks twenty-five years later? His only remaining lead was the other kids who joined the theater group at the same time as Sadako. Of the seven who'd come in that year, he'd only been able to find contact info for four. If none of them knew anything about Sadako's whereabouts, the trail would have gone dead. And Yoshino had a feeling that was exactly what would happen. He looked at his watch. Eleven in the morning. He dashed into a nearby stationery shop to send a fax to the Izu Oshima Bureau. 
He might as well tell Asakawa everything he'd found out to this point. At that very moment, Asakawa and Ryuji were at the bureau, Hayatsu's home. Hey, Asakawa, calm down, Ryuji yelled toward Asakawa, who was pacing around the room with his back turned. Panicking won't help, you know. The typhoon warnings flowed steadily from the radio. Maximum wind velocity, barometric pressure near the eye of the storm, millibars, north-northeasterly winds, areas of violent wind and rain, heavy swellings. It all rubbed Asakawa the wrong way. At the moment, Typhoon Number 21 was centered on a point in the sea roughly 150 kilometers south from Cape Omaezaki, advancing in a north-northeasterly direction at a speed of roughly 20 kilometers an hour, maintaining wind speeds of 40 meters per second. At this rate, it would hit the sea just south of Oshima by evening. It would probably be tomorrow, Thursday, before air and sea travel was restored. At least, that was Hayatsu's forecast. <laughs> Thursday, he says. Asakawa was seething. My deadline is tomorrow night at ten, you damn typhoon. Hurry up and blow through or turn into a tropical depression or something. When the hell are we going to be able to catch a plane or a boat off this island? Asakawa wanted to get angry at someone, but didn't know who. I never should have come here. I'll regret it forever. And that's not all. I don't even know where to begin regretting. I never should have watched that video. I never should have got curious about Tomoko Oishi and Suichi Iwata's deaths. I never should have taken a cab that day. Shit. Don't you know how to relax? Complaining to Mr. Hayatsu isn't going to get you anywhere. Ryuji grabbed Asakawa's arm with an unexpected gentleness. Think about it this way. Maybe the charm is something that can only be carried out on the island. It's at least possible. Why didn't the brats use the charm? Maybe they didn't have the money to come to Oshima. It's plausible. Maybe these storm clouds will have a silver lining. At least try to believe it, and maybe you'll be able to calm down. That's if we can figure out what the charm is. Asakawa brushed away Ryuji's hand. Asakawa saw how Hayatsu and his wife Fumiko exchanged a glance, and it seemed to them they were laughing. Two grown men going on about charms. What's so funny? He started to advance on them, but Ryuji grabbed his arm with more force than before and pulled him back. Knock it off. You're wasting your energy. Hey, Jessica, Billy, folks joining us, welcome. Seeing Asakawa's irritation, the kind-hearted Hayatsu had begun to feel almost responsible for transportation being disrupted on account of the typhoon. Or perhaps he was just sympathetic at the sight of people suffering so because of the storm. He prayed for the su success of Asakawa's project. A fax was due to arrive from Tokyo, but waiting seemed only to ratchet up Asakawa's annoyance. Hayatsu tried to defuse the situation. "'How's your investigation coming?' Hayatsu asked gently, seeming to calm Asakawa. "'Well, one of Shizuko Yamamura's childhood friends lives right nearby. If you'd like, I can call him over and you can hear what he has to say. Old Jen won't be out fishing on a day like this. I'm sure he's bored. He'd be happy to come over.' Hayatsu figured if he gave Asakawa something else to investigate, it would be bound to distract him. He's nearing seventy, so I don't know how well he'll be able to answer your questions, but it has to be better than just waiting. All right. Without even waiting for the answer, Hayatsu turned around and called to his wife in the kitchen. Hey, call Jen's place and have him get over here right away. Just as Hayatsu had said, Genji was happy to talk to them. He seemed to like nothing better than talking about Shizuko Yamamura. He was sixty-eight, three years older than Shizuko would have been. She'd been his childhood playmate and his first love. Whether it was because the memories became clearer as he talked about them, or because he was stimulated by having an audience, the recollections came pouring out of him. For Genji, talking about Shizuko was talking about his own youth. Asakawa and Ryuji learned a certain amount from his rambling, occasionally tearful stories about Shizuko, but they were aware they could only trust old Jen so far. Memories were always liable to be prettified, and all of this had happened over forty years ago. He might even be getting her confused with another woman. Well, maybe not. A man's first love was special. Not someone he'd mix up with someone else. Genji wasn't exactly eloquent. He used a lot of roundabout expressions, and Asakawa soon got tired of listening. But then he said something that had Asakawa and Ryuji listening intently. I think what made Shizu change was that stone statue of the aesthetic we pulled up out of the sea. There was a full moon that night. According to the old man, Shizuko's mysterious powers were somehow connected to the sea and the full moon, and on the night it happened, Genji himself had been beside her rowing the boat. 
It was 1946, on a night toward the end of summer. Shizuko was 21, and Genji was 24. It was hot for so late in the season, and even nightfall brought no relief. Genji spoke of these events of 44 years ago as though they'd happened last night. The sweltering evening, Genji was sitting on his front porch lazily fanning himself, gazing at the night sky calmly reflected on the moonlit sea. The silence was broken when Shizu came running up the hill to his house. She stood in front of him, tugging at his sleeve, and cried, "'Jen, get your boat! We're going fishing!' He asked her why, but all she would say was, "'We'll never have another moonlit night like this.' Genji just sat there as if in a daze, looking at the most beautiful girl on the island. "'Wipe that stupid look off your face and hurry up!' She pulled at his collar until he got to his feet. Genji was used to having her push him around and tell him what to do, but he asked her anyway, "'What in the world are we going fishing for?' Staring at the ocean, she gave a brisk reply, the statue of an aesthetic. Of the aesthetic? With raised eyebrows and a note of regret in her voice, Shizuko explained that earlier in the day some occupation soldiers had hurled the stone statue of the aesthetic in the sea. In the middle of the island's eastern shore there was a beach called the Aesthetic's Beach, with a small cave called the Aesthetic's Grotto. It contained a stone statue of Enno Ozuno the famed Buddhist aesthetic, who'd been banished here in the year 699. Ozunu had been born with great wisdom, and long years of discipline had given him command of occult and mystic arts. It was said he could summon gods and demons at will. But Ozuno's power to foretell the future had made him powerful enemies in the book, world of books and weapons, and he'd been judged a criminal, a menace to society, and exiled here to Izu Oshima. That had been almost 1,300 years ago. Ozunu holed himself up in a small cave on the beach and devoted himself to even more strenuous disciplines. He also taught farming and fishing to the people of the island, earning respect for his virtue. Finally, he was pardoned and allowed to return to the mainland, where he founded the Shugendo monastic tradition. He was thought to have spent three years on the island, but stories of his time there abounded, including the legend he had once shot himself with iron clogs and flown off to Mount Fuji. The islander still retained a great deal of affection for Enno Ozuno, and the Aesthetics Grotto was considered the holiest place on the island. A festival known as the Festival of the Aesthetic was held every year on June 15th. Right after the end of World War II, however, as part of their policy towards Shintoism and Buddhism, the occupation forces had taken Enno Ozuno's statue from where it was enshrined in the cave and tossed it into the ocean. Shizuko, who had deep faith in Ozunu, had ev evidently been watching. She'd hid herself in the shadow of the rocks at Worm's Nose Point and watched carefully as the statue was cast from the American patrol boat. She memorized the exact spot. I'm so angry right now. I didn't know. But of course, of course, Americans... Of course the Americans that were in Japan probably destroyed temples and shit, because why wouldn't they? Americans suck. Ugh. Genji couldn't believe his ears when he heard they were going fishing for the statue. He was a good fisherman with strong arms, but he'd never tried to catch a stone statue. But there was no way he could just turn Shizuko down, given the secret feelings he nursed for her. He launched his boat into the night, thinking to take this opportunity to put her in his debt. And truth be told, being out on the sea under a beautiful moon like this, just the two of them, promised to be a wonderful thing. They'd built fires on aesthetic speech and at Worm's Nose as landmarks, and now they rowed farther and farther out to sea. Both of them were quite familiar with the ocean here. The lie of the seafloor, the depth, and the ocean schools of fish that swam here. But now it was night time, and no matter how bright the moon, it illuminated nothing beneath the surface. Genji didn't know how Shizuko intended to find the statue. He asked her while working the oars, but she didn't answer. She just checked their position again by the bonfires on the beach. One might have been able to get a pretty good idea of where they were by gazing over the waves at the fire on the beach and estimate the distance between them. After they had rowed several hundred meters, Shizuko cried, "'Stop here!' She went to the stern of the boat, leaned down close to the surface of the water, and peered into the dark sea. "'Look the other way,' she commanded Genji. Genji guessed what Shizuko was about to do, and his heart leapt. Shizuko stood up and took off her splash-patterned kimono. His imagination aroused by the sound of the robe slipping across her skin, Genji found it hard to breathe. Behind him he heard the sound of her jumping into the sea. 
As the spray hit his shoulders, he turned around and looked. Shizuko was treading water, her long black hair tied back with a rag, and one end of a slender rope clenched between her teeth. She thrust her upper body out of the water, took two deep breaths, then dived to the bottom of the sea. How many times did her head pop up from the surface of the water to gasp for air? The last time, she no longer held the end of the rope in her mouth. I've tied it fast to the aesthetic. Go ahead and pull him up, she said in a trembling voice. Genji shifted his body to the bow of the boat and pulled on the rope. In no time, Shizuko climbed aboard, draped her kimono around her body, and came up beside Genji in time to help him haul up the statue. They placed it in the center of the boat and headed back to shore. The way whole way back, neither Genji nor Shizuko said a word. There was something in the atmosphere that quashed all questions. He found it mysterious she'd been able to locate the statue in the darkness at the bottom of the sea. It was only three days later he was able to ask her. She said that the aesthetic's eyes had called to her on the ocean floor. The green eyes of the statue, master of gods and demons, had glowed at the bottom of the deep dark sea. That's what Shizuko had said. After that, Shizuko began to feel physical discomfort. She'd never even had a headache up till then, but now she often experienced searing pains in her head, accompanied by visions of things she'd never seen before flashing across her mind's eye. And it happened that these scenes she glimpsed very soon manifested themselves in reality. Genji had questioned her in some detail. It seems that when these future scenes inserted themselves into her brain, they were always accompanied by the same citrus fragrance in her nostrils. Genji's older sister had married and moved to Odawara on the mainland. When she died, the scene had presented itself to Shizuko beforehand. But it didn't sound like she could actually consciously predict things that would happen in the future. It was just these scenes would flash across her mind with no warning, and no inkling of why she'd witnessed these exact scenes. So Shizuko never allowed people to ask her to predict their futures. The following year, she went up to Tokyo despite Genji's efforts to stop her. She came to know Heihachiro Okuma and conceived his child. Then at the end of the year, she went back to her hometown and gave birth to a baby girl, Sadako. They didn't know when Genji's tale would end. Ten years later, Shizuko jumped into the mount of Mount Mihara, and to judge by the way Genji related the event, it seemed he'd decided to blame it on her lover, Ikuma. It was perhaps a natural thought, as he had been Genji's rival in love, but his obvious resentment made it hard to sit through. All they had gleaned from him was the knowledge that Sadako's mother had been able to see the future, and the possibility that the power had been given to her by a stone statue of En no Uzunu. Just then, the fax machine began to hum. As it printed out a lar an enlargement of the large head of Sadako Yamamura, Shizu Yoshino had gotten from theater group Soaring. Asakawa? Hello. I can't finish this first. No, it's a creepy book. Say hi. Hi. You can't listen. Go away. You can't listen. Uh, Gandhi's still in Giddy's room, isn't he? Well, he's not in here. Go find him. No. Shoot. Asakawa was strangely moved. This was the first actual look he'd had of the woman. Even though it had only been for the briefest moment, he'd shared the same sensations as her, seen the world from the same vantage point. It was like catching the first glimpse of a lover's face in the dim morning light, finally seeing what she looks like after a night of entwined limbs and shared orgasms in the dark. It was odd, but he couldn't think of her as hideous. That was only natural, although the photo that came through the fax machine was somewhat blurred around the edges. Still, it fully communicated the allure of Sadako's beautifully regular features. She's a fine woman, isn't she? Ryuji said. Asakawa suddenly recalled my Takano. If you compared them purely on the basis of looks, Sadako was far more beautiful than Mai. And yet the scent of a woman was much more powerful with Mai. And what about that eerie quality that was supposed to characterize Sadako? It didn't come through in the photograph. Sadako had powers ordinary people didn't have. They must have influenced the people around her. The second page of the facts summarized information about Shizuko Yamamura. It picked up right when Genji's story had left off. In 1947, having left behind her hometown of Sashikiji for the capital, Shizuko suddenly collapsed with head pains and was taken to a hospital. Through one of the doctors, she came to know Heihachiro Ikuma, an assistant professor in the psychiatry department of Taito University. 
Ikuma was involved in trying to find a scientific explanation for hypnotism and related phenomena, and he became very interested in Shizuko when he discovered she had startling powers of clairvoyance. The finding went so far as to change the thrust of his research. Thereafter, Ikuma would immerse himself in the study of paranormal powers, with Shizuko as the subject of his research. But the two soon progressed beyond a mere researcher-subject relationship. In spite of his having a family, Ikuma began to have romantic feelings towards Shizuko. By the end of the year, she was pregnant with his child, and to escape the eyes of the world, she went back home, where she had Sadako. Shizuko immediately returned to Tokyo, leaving Sadako in Sashikiji, but three years later returned to claim the child. From then until the time of her suicide, evidently, she never let Sadako leave her side. When the 1950s dawned, the partnership of Heihachiro Ikuma and Shizuko Yamamura was a sensation in the pages of the newspapers and the weekly news magazines. They provided a sudden insight into the scientific underpinnings of supernatural powers. At first, perhaps dazzled by Ikuma's position as a professor at such a prestigious university, the public unanimously believed in Shizuko's powers. Even the media wrote her up in a more or less favorable light. Still, there were persistent claims she could be a fake, and when an authoritative scholarly association weighed in with the one-word comment questionable, people began to shift their support away from the pair. The paranormal powers Shizuko exhibited were mainly ESP-related, such as clairvoyance or second sight, and the ability to produce psychic photographs. She didn't display the power of telekinesis, the ability to move things without touching them. According to one magazine, simply by holding a piece of film in a tightly sealed envelope against her forehead, she could psychically imprint upon it a specified design. She could also identify the image on a similarly concealed piece of film a hundred times out of a hundred. However, another magazine maintained she was nothing more than a con woman, claiming any magician with some training could do the same thing. In this way, the tide of public opinion began to rise against Shizuko and Ikuma. Then Shizuko was visited by misfortune. In 1954, she gave birth to her second baby, but it became ill and died at only four months of age. It had been a boy. Sadako, who was seven at the time, seemed to have showered a special affection on her newborn little brother. The following year, in 1955, Ikuma challenged the media to a public demonstration of Suzuko's powers. At first, Shizuko didn't want to do it. She said it was hard to concentrate her awareness the way she wanted among a mass of spectators. She was afraid she'd fail. But Ikuma was unyielding. He couldn't stand being labeled a charlatan by the media and couldn't think of a better way to outwit them but than by offering clear proof of her authenticity. On the appointed day, Shizuko reluctantly mounted the dais in the lab theater, under the watchful eyes of nearly a hundred scholars and representatives of the press. She was mentally exhausted to boot, so there were hardly the best conditions for her to work under. The experiment was to proceed along quite simple lines. All she had to do was identify the numbers on a pair of dice in a lead container. If she'd just been able to exert her powers normally, it would have been no problem. But she knew each one of the hundred people surrounding her was waiting and hoping for her to fail. She trembled. She crouched on the floor. She cried out in anguish. Enough of this! Shizuko herself explained it this way. Everybody had a certain degree of psychic power. She just had more of it than others did. But surrounded by a hundred people willing her to fail, her power was disrupted. She couldn't get it to work. Akuma went even further. It's not just a hundred people. No, now the whole population of Japan is trying to stamp out the fruits of my research. When public opinion fanned by the media begins to turn, then the media says nothing the people don't want to hear. They should be ashamed. Thus, the great public display of clairvoyance ended with Ikuma's denunciation of the mass media. Of course, the media interpreted Ikuma's diatribe as an attempt to shift the blame for the failed demonstration, and that's how it was written in all the daily newspapers. Ah, uh, a fake after all, their true colors revealed. Taito University professor a fraud. Five years of debate ended. Victory for modern science. Not a single article defended them. Toward the end of the year, Ikuma divorced his wife and resigned from the university. Shizuko began to become increasingly paranoid. After that, Ikuma decided to acquire paranormal abilities himself, and he retreated deep into the mountains and stood under waterfalls, but all he got was pulmonary tuberculosis. He had to be committed to a sanatorium in Hakone. Meanwhile, Shizuko's psychological state was becoming more and more precarious. Eight-year-old Sadako convinced her mother to go back home to Sashikiji to escape the eyes of the media and the ridicule of the public. But then Shizuko slipped her daughter's gaze and jumped into the volcano. 
and so three people's lives crumbled. Asakawa and Ryuji finish reading the two-page printout at the same time. It's a grudge, muttered Ryuji. Imagine how Sadako must have felt when her mom threw herself into Mount Mihara. She hated the media? Not just the media. She resented the public at large for destroying her family, first treating them like darlings, and then when the wind changed, scorning them. Sadako was with her mother and father between the ages of three and ten, right? She had first-hand knowledge of the vagaries of public opinion. But that's no reason to arrange an indiscriminate attack like this. Asakawa's objection was made in full consciousness of the fact that he himself belonged to the media. In his heart, he was making excuses. He was pleading. Hey, I'm just as critical of the media's tendencies as you are. What are you mumbling about? Huh? Asakawa realized, unknowingly, he'd been voicing his complaints as if they were a Buddhist chant. Well, we've begun to eliminate the uh, images on the video. Mount Mihara appears because it's where her mother killed herself, and because Sadako herself had predicted its eruption. It must have made a particularly strong psychic impression on her. The next scene shows the character for Mountain, Yama, floating into view. It's probably the first psychic photograph Sadako succeeded in making when she was very small. Very small? Asakawa didn't see why it had to be from when she was very small. Yeah, probably from when she was four or five. Next, there's the scene with the dice. Sadako was present during her mother's public demonstration. This scene means she was watching, worried, as her mother tried to guess the numbers on the dice. Hold on a minute, though. Sadako clearly saw the numbers on the dice in the lead bowl. Both Asakawa and Ryuji had watched the scene with their own eyes, so to speak. There was no mistaking. And? Shizuko couldn't see them. Is it so strange the daughter could do what the mother couldn't? Look, Sadako was only seven then, but her power already far outstripped her mother's. So much so that the combined unconscious will of a hundred people was nothing to her. Think about it. This is a girl who could project images onto a cathode ray tube. Televisions produce images by an entirely different mechanism from photography. It's not just a matter of expo exposing film to light. A picture on TV is composed of 525 lines, right? Sadako could manipulate those. This power is of a completely different order here. Asakawa still wasn't convinced. If she had so much power, what about the psychic photo she sent to Professor Miura? She should have been able to produce something more impressive. You're dumber than you look. Her mother gained nothing but unhappiness by letting people know about her power. Her mother probably didn't want her to make the same mistake. She probably told Sadako to hide her abilities and lead a normal life. Sadako probably carefully restrained herself so as to produce only an average photo. Sadako had stayed in the rehearsal hall alone after everyone else left so she could test her powers on the television set, still a rarity in those days. She was trying to be careful not to let anyone know what she could do. "'Who's the old woman who appears in the next scene?' asked Asakawa. "'I don't know who that is. Perhaps she came to Sadako in a dream or something, whispered prophecies in her ear. She was using an old dialect. I'm sure you've noticed everyone here now speaks fairly standard Japanese.' That lady was pretty old. Maybe she lived in the twelfth century, or maybe she had some connection to Enno Uzuno. Next year, you're going to have a child. I wonder if that prediction really came true. Oh, that? Well, there's the scene with the baby boy right after that. I originally thought it meant Sadako had given birth to a boy, but according to the facts, that doesn't appear to be the case. There's her, br her brother who died at four months old. Right, I think that's it. But what about the prediction? The old woman is definitely speaking to Sadako. She says, you. Did Sadako have a baby? I don't know. If we believe the old lady, I guess she did. Whose child was it? How should I know? Listen, don't think I know everything. I'm just speculating here. If Sadako Yamamura had a child, who was the father? And what was the child doing now? Ryuji stood up suddenly, banging his knees on the table as a result. I thought I was getting hungry. Look, it's way past noon. Asakawa, I'm going to get something to eat. So saying, Ryuji headed for the door, rubbing his kneecaps. Asakawa had no appetite, but something still bothered him, and he decided to tag along. He just remembered something Ryuji had told him to investigate, something he'd had no clue how to approach and hadn't done anything about. This was the question of the identity of the man in the video's last scene. It might be Sadako's father, Heihachiro Ikuma, but there was too much enmity in the way Sadako looked at him for that. When he'd seen the man's face on the screen, Asakawa had felt a dull, heavy pain somewhere deep inside his body, accompanied by a strong feeling of antipathy. He was a rather handsome man, particularly around the eyes. He wondered why she hated him so. 
No matter what, that kind of gaze was not one Sadako should have turned on a relative. There was nothing in Yoshino's report to suggest she'd squared off against her father. Rather, he got the impression she was close to her parents. Asakawa suspe suspected it would be impossible to discover the identity of this man. Nearly thirty years had undoubtedly changed his looks considerably. Still, on the off chance, maybe he should ask Yoshino to dig up a photo of Ikuma. He wondered what Ryuji would think about this. Wanting to take the matter up with him, Asakawa followed Ryuji outside. The wind blew loudly. There was no point in using an umbrella. Asakawa and Ryuji hunched their shoulders and ran down the street to a bar in front of the harbor. How about a beer? Without waiting for a reply, Ryuji turned to the waitress and called out, Two beers! Ryuji, go back to our earlier conversation. What do you think the images on the video are, finally? Don't know. Ryuji was too busy eating his Korean barbecue lunch special to even look up, so he gave a curt answer. Asakawa stabbed a sausage with his fork and took a swallow of his beer. Out the window they could see the pier. There was nobody at the ticket window for the Tokai Kisen ferry line. Everything was silent. No doubt all the tourists trapped on the island were sitting at the windows of their hotels or B&Bs, looking worriedly at the same dark sea and sky. Ryuji looked up. I imagine you've probably heard what people say goes through a person's mind at the moment of death, right? Asakawa returned his gaze to the scene in front of him. The scenes from your life that have made the deepest impression on you are replayed, sort of like a flashback. Asakawa had read a book in which the author described an experience along those lines. The author had been driving his car along a mountain road where he lost control of the steering wheel, plunging the car into a deep ravine. During the split second the car hung in the air after leaving the road, the author realized he was going to die. And at the instant he realized that, a sequence of different images through his life came pitter-pattering up and flashed through his brain, so clearly he could see every detail. In the end, miraculously, the writer had survived, but the memory of the instant remained vivid for him. "'You can't be suggesting. Is that what this is?' Asakawa asked. Ryuji raised a hand and signaled the waitress to bring him another beer. "'All I'm saying is, that's what the video reminds me of. Each of those scenes represents a moment of extreme psychic or emotional engagement for Sadako. It's not much of a stretch to think they were the scenes in her life that left the deepest impression, is it?' "'I get it, but does that mean that—' "'Right. There's a strong possibility that's the case.' So Sadako Yamamura is no longer of this world. She died, and the scenes which flitted through her mind at the moment of death had taken shape and remained in the world of the living. Was that it? So why did she die? And another thing, what was her relationship with the man in the last scene of the video? I told you to stop asking me so many questions. There's a lot I don't understand about it either. Asakawa looked unconvinced. Try using your head for a change. You rely too much on other people. What would you do if something happened to me and you were stuck trying to figure out the charm all by yourself? That hardly seemed likely. Asakawa might die and Ryuji might solve the riddle alone, but the opposite would never happen. Asakawa was sure of it, if nothing else. They went back to the bureau where Hayatsu was waiting for them. You had a call from a fellow named Yoshino. He wasn't at his office, so he said he'd call back in ten minutes. Asakawa sat in front of the phone and prayed for good news. The phone rang. It was Yoshino. I've been trying to call you. Where were you? There was a note of reproach in his voice. Sorry about that. We went to get a bite to eat. Okay. Now did you get my facts? Yoshino's tone changed. The note of criticism disappeared and his voice became gentler. Asakawa felt something unpleasant coming. Yeah, thanks. It was very helpful. So did you find out what happened to Sadako after that? There was a pause before Yoshino replied, No, I hit a dead end. The second he heard this, Asakawa's face crumpled as if he were about to burst into sobs. Ryuji watched as if he found it amusing to see a man's expression turn from hope to despair before his eyes. Then he plopped himself down on the floor facing the garden and stretched his legs out in front of him. What do you mean a dead end? Asakawa's voice had ridden several notes. I'm only able to locate four of the interns who joined the group with Sadako. I called them, but none of them know anything. They're all middle-aged guys, around fifty now. All of them could tell me was that they hadn't seen her since shortly after the death of Shige Mori, the company's representative. There's no more information to be had about Sadako Yamamura. Nonsense! This can't be the end of it! Well, how does it look on your end? How does it look on my end? I'll tell you how it looks. It looks like I'm going to die tomorrow night at ten o'clock. And not just me, my wife and daughter are going to die Sunday morning. That's how it looks. Ryuji called out from behind him. Hey, don't forget about me. You'll make me feel bad. 
Asakawa ignored him and continued. There have got to be some other things we can try. Maybe there's someone besides the interns who would know what happened to Sadako. Listen, my family's lives depend upon it. Not necessarily, though. What are you talking about? Maybe you'll still be alive after the deadline passes. <sighs> you don't believe me. I get it. Asakawa could feel the whole world go dark before his eyes. Well, I mean, how could I really believe 100% in a story like this? Now look, Yoshino. How should he put it? What did he need to say to convince him? I don't even believe the half of it myself. It's stupid. A charm, come on. But you see, if there's a once in six chance it's all true, it's like Russian roulette. You've got a gun with one bullet in it, and you know there's only one chance when you pull the trigger it'll kill you. But could you pull the trigger? Would you risk your family on those odds? No, you wouldn't. You'd move the muzzle away from your temple. If you could, you'd throw the whole damned gun into the ocean. Right? It's only natural. Asakawa was all wound up now. Behind him, Ryuji was wailing. We're idiots! Both of us were idiots! Shut up! Asakawa shielded the receiver with the palm of his hand and turned to yell at Ryuji. Something wrong? Yoshino lowered the tone of his voice. No, it's nothing. Listen, Yoshino, I'm begging you. You're the only one I can count on. Suddenly, Ryuji grabbed Asakawa's arm. Giving way to anger, Asakawa spun around, but when he saw, Ryuji was looking unexpectedly earnest. We're idiots. You and I have both lost our cool, he said quietly. Could you hold on a minute? Asakawa lowered the receiver. Then to Ryuji, what's the matter? It's so simple. Why didn't we think of it before? There's no need to follow Sadako's trail chronologically. Why can't we work our way backwards? Why did it have to be Cabin B4? Why did it have to be Villa Log Cabin? Why did it have to be South Hakone Pacific Land? Asakawa's expression changed in a heartbeat as he came to a realization. Then in a much calmer mood, he picked up the receiver again. Yoshino! Yoshino was still waiting on the other end of the line. Yoshino, forget about the theater company for a minute. There's something else I urgently need you to check up on. It's just come up. I believe I've already told you about South Hakone Pacific Land. Yeah, you did. It's a resort club, right? Right. As I recall, they built a golf course there ten years ago and then gradually expanded to where they are now. Listen, what I need you to look up is what was there before Pacific Land? He could hear the scratching of pen on paper. What do you mean, what was there? Probably nothing but mountain meadows. You may be right, but then again, you may be wrong. Ryuji tugged at Asakawa's sleeve again. In a layout. If there was something standing on that land before the resort, tell your gentleman caller to get a map that shows the layout of the buildings and the ground. Asakawa relayed the request to Yoshino and hung up the phone, willing him to come up with something, anything by way of a lead. It was true. Everybody had a little psychic power. Do, do, do. Chapter 10 The wind was a little stronger, and low white clouds raced by in the otherwise clear sky. Typhoon number 21 had passed by the previous evening, grazing the Bozo Peninsula to the northeast of Oshima before dissipating over the ocean. In its wake, it left painfully dazzling blue seas. In spite of the peaceful autumn weather, as Asakawa stood on the deck of the boat watching the waves, he felt like a condemned man on the eve of his execution. Raising his eyes so he could see the gentle slope of the Izu highlands in the middle distance, today at last he would face his deadline. It was now ten in the morning. In another twelve hours it would come unerringly. It had been a week since he'd watched the video in Cabin B4. It seemed like ages ago. Of course it felt like a long time. In one week he'd experienced more terror than most people experience in a lifetime. Asakawa wasn't sure now that being cooped up on Oshima all day Wednesday had hurt him. On the phone yesterday, he'd got excited and accused Yoshino of dragging his feet, but now that he thought about things calmly, he was actually very grateful to his colleague for doing so much for him. If Asakawa had been running around chasing leads himself, he probably would have gotten agitated and missed something, or gone down a blind alley. This is fine. The typhoon was on our side. If he didn't think that way, he'd never make it. Asakawa was starting to prepare his mind so that when his time came to die, he wouldn't be consumed with regrets about what he had or hadn't done. Their last clue was the three-page printout he held in his hand. Yoshino had spent half the previous day tracking down the information before faxing it. Before South Hakone Pacific Land had been built, the land had been occupied by a rather unusual facility. Unusual these days, that is. At the time, establishments like it were perfectly run-of-the-mill. It was a tuberculosis treatment facility, a sanatorium. 
Nowadays, few people lived in fear of TB, but if one read much pre-war fiction, one couldn't help but come across mention of it. It was the tuberculosis bacillus that made Thomas Mann, the impentus, to write The Magic Mountain, that allowed Motojiro Kaiji to sing with piercing clarity of his decay. However, the discovery of streptomycin in 1944 and hydrazide in 1950 stole TB's literary cachet, reducing its status to that of just another communicable disease. In the 20s and 30s, as many as 200,000 people a year were dying from it, but the number dropped drastically after the war. Even so, the bacillus didn't become extinct. Even now, it still kills around 5,000 people a year. In the days when TB ran rampant, clean, fresh air and a quiet, peaceful environment were deemed essential for recovery. Thus, sanatoriums were built in mountainous areas. But as progress in medicinal treatments produced a corresponding drop in the number of patients, the facilities had to adjust their range of services. In other words, they had to start treating internal ailments, even performing surgeries, or else they wouldn't be able to survive financially. In the mid-1960s, the sanatorium in South Hakone was faced with just this choice. But it, its situation was even more critical than most due to its extreme remoteness. It was just too hard to get to. With TB, once patients checked in, they usually didn't check back out. So ease of access wasn't much of an issue. But it proved to be a fatal flaw in the plan to transform the place into a general hospital. The sanatorium ended up shutting down in 1972. Waiting in the wings was Pacific Resorts, which had been looking for a suitable location to build a golf course and resort. In 1975, Pacific Resorts bought a section of Alpine land, which included the old sanatorium site, and immediately set about developing their golf course. Later, they built summer homes to sell, a hotel, a swimming pool, an athletic club, and tennis courts, the whole line of resort facilities. And in April of this year, six months ago, they'd put the finishing touches to Villa Log Cabin. What kind of place is it, then? Ryuji was supposed to be on deck, but he suddenly appeared in the seat next to Asakawa. Hmm? South Hakone Pacific Land, of course. That's right, he's never been there. It's got a nice view at night, Asakawa recalled the curiously lifeless atmosphere, the tennis balls with their hollow echo under the orange lights. Where does that atmosphere come from, anyway? I wonder how many people died there when it was a sanatorium. Asakawa pondered this as he remembered how the beautiful evening lights of Numazao and Mishima had spread out at his feet. Asakawa put the first page of the printout on the bottom and spread the other two pages on his lap. The second page was the simple diagram showing the layout of the sanatorium grounds. The third showed the building as it was today, an elegant three-story building containing an information center and a restaurant. This was the building Asakawa had entered to ask directions to Villa Log Cabin. Asakawa shifted his gaze back and forth between the two pages. The passage of nearly thirty years was embodied in those two pieces of paper. If it wasn't for the fact that the access road was in the same place, he'd have no idea what was on one map corresponding to the other. Mentally reconstructing the layout as he knew it, he looked at the second page to try and find out what had originally stood where the cabins were now. He couldn't be absolutely sure, but when he lay one page on top of the other, it certainly seemed as if nothing had been there before, just thick woods covering the side of the valley. He went back to the first page. It contained one more very important piece of information, besides the story of the sanatorium's transformation into a resort. Jotaro Nagayo, 57, a doctor, a GP and pediatrician with a private practice in Atami. For five years, from 1962 to 67, Nagao had worked at the South Hakone Sanatorium. He'd been young, just past his internship. Of the doctors who'd been there at the time, the only ones still alive were Nagao and Yozo Tanaka, who were retired now, living with his daughter and her husband in Nagasaki. All the rest, including the head of the facility, were dead. Therefore, Dr. Nagao were the, was the only chance to find out anything about the sanatorium in South Hakone. Yozo Tanaka was already 80, and Nagasaki was much too far away. They wouldn't have time to visit him. Asakawa had pleaded desperately with Yoshino to find a living witness, and Yoshino, gritting his teeth to keep from yelling back at Asakawa, had come up with Dr. Nagao. He'd sent not only the man's name and address, but also an interesting summary of his career. It was probably just something Yoshino had happened to come across in his research, but he decided to append it, not actually meaning anything about it. Dr. Nagao had been at the sanatorium from 62 to 67, but he hadn't spent the entirety of those five years in the performance of his duties. For two weeks, a short time to be sure, but significant, he'd gone from doctor to patient and been housed in an isolation ward. 
In the summer of 1966, while visiting an isolation ward up in the mountains, he'd carelessly allowed himself to contract the smallpox virus from a patient. Fortunately, he'd been inoculated a few years previously, so it didn't turn into anything major. No visible outbreak, no recurrence of the fever, only minor symptoms. But they'd put him in isolation to keep him from infecting anyone else. What was so interesting was this had assured Nagao a place in the medical history. He'd been the last smallpox patient in Japan. It wasn't necessarily something that would get him in the Guinness Book, but Yoshino seemed to have thought it was interesting. For people of Asakawa and Ryuji's generation, the word smallpox didn't even register. Ryuji, have you ever had smallpox? Idiot. Of course not. It's extinct. Yeah, extinct? Yes, eradicated through human ingenuity. Smallpox no longer exists in this world. The World Health Organization had made a dedicated effort to wipe out smallpox through vaccinations, and as a result it had all but disappeared from the face of the earth by 75. There are records of the last smallpox patient in the world, a Somalian youth who came down with it on October 26, 1977. Can a virus become extinct? Is that possible? Asakawa didn't know much about viruses, but he couldn't shake the impression that no matter how you tried to kill one, eventually it would mutate and find a way to survive. See, viruses kind of wander around on the border between living things and non-living things. Some people even theorize they were originally human genes, but nobody really knows where they come from or how they emerged. What's certain is they're intimately connected with the appearance and evolution of life. Ryuji's arms had been folded behind his head. Now he stretched them wide. His eyes glittered. Don't you find it fascinating, Asakawa? The idea that genes could escape from our cells and become another life form. Maybe all opposites were originally identical, even light and darkness. Before the Big Bang, they were living together in peace with no contradiction. God and the devil, too. All the devil is is a god who fell from grace. They're the same thing originally. Male and female? It used to be all living things were hermaphroditic, like worms and slugs with both uh, sex organs. Don't you think that's the ultimate symbol of power and beauty? Ryuji laughed as he said it. I'm sure it'd save a lot of time and trouble when it comes to sex. Well, I'm not going to read that paragraph. Are there any other extinct viruses? Gee, if you're so interested, I suggest you look right into it when you get back to Tokyo. If I get back. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get back. At that moment, the high-speed boat they were on was exactly halfway through the voyage linking Oshima and Ito on the Izu Peninsula. They could have made it back to Tokyo quicker by flying, but they wanted to see Dr. Nagao in Natami, so they'd taken the sea route. Straight ahead, they could see the Ferris wheel at the Atami Korakuen. They were arriving right on time at 10.50. Asakawa descended the gangway and ran to the parking lot where they'd left their rental car. Calm down, would you? Ryuji followed at a leisurely pace. Nagao's clinic was near Kinomina Station on the Ito line, not very far away at all. Asakawa watched impatiently as Ryuji climbed into the car and then headed out into Atami's maze of hills and one-way streets. What was the paragraph? Eh, it was some transphobic bullshit. Immediately after he'd settled himself, Ryuji said, with a perfectly straight face, I was thinking, maybe the devil's behind this whole thing after all. Asakawa was too busy looking at street signs to answer. Ryuji continued, The devil always appears in the world in a different form. You know the bubonic plague that ravaged Europe in the second half of the 13th century? Half the total population died. Can you believe it? Half! That's like the population of Japan being reduced to 60 million. Naturally, artists at the time likened the plague to the devil. It's like that now, too. Don't we talk about AIDS as if it were a modern devil? But listen, devils never drive humanity to extinction. Why? If people cease to exist, so do devils. The same with viruses. If the host cell perishes, the virus can't survive. But humanity drove the smallpox virus to extinction. Really? Could we really do that? It's impossible in the modern world to even imagine the terror once inspired by smallpox, when it raged throughout the world, claiming so many lives. Such was the suffering it caused that it gave rise to innumerable religious beliefs and superstitions in Japan as well as elsewhere. People believed in gods of pestilence, and it was the god of smallpox that brought the disease, though perhaps it should have been called a devil. In any case, could people really drive a god to the brink of a dis extinction? Ryuji's question harbored a deep uncertainty. Asakawa wasn't listening to Ryuji. In some corner of his mind, he wondered why the guy was rambling on about this now, but mainly he was just thinking about not making any wrong turns. Every nerve focused on getting to Dr. Nagao's clinic as fast as possible.
Yeah, the the character is a real jerk. Both of the characters are kind of real jerks, but the dialogue is very well written. This it, the, uh, Ryuji reminds me of Vincent. He's a huge asshole, and he has all the best lines. <laughs> Chapter 11 In a lane in front of Kinomiya Station was a small one-story house with a shingle by the door that read Nagao Clinic Internal Medicine and Pediatrics. Asakawa and Ryuji stood in front of the door for some time. If they couldn't pull away any information out of Nagao, it'd be, sorry, time's up. But there was no more time to scare up new leads. What was there to find out from him? It was probably hoping for too much to think that he'd even remember much of anything about Sadako Yamamura from thirty years ago. They didn't even have any hard evidence Sadako had any connection at all with the sanatorium in South Hakone. All of Nagao's colleagues at the sanatorium, except for Yozo Tanaka, had died of old age. They probably could have tracked down the names of some nurses if they'd tried, but it was too late for that now. Asakawa looked at his watch, 11.30. Only a little over ten hours until the deadline, and here he was, hesitating to open the door. "'What are you waiting for? Go on in!' Ryuji gave him a shove. Of course, he could understand why Asakawa was hesitating, even though he'd been in such a hurry to get here. He was scared. No doubt he was afraid of seeing his last hope dashed, his last chance to survive eliminated. Ryuji stepped in front of him and opened the door. A couch big enough for three people stood along one wall of the small waiting room. Conveniently, there were no patients waiting. Ryuji bent over at the little receptionist window and spoke to the middle-aged nurse behind it. "'Excuse me, we'd like to see the doctor.' Without lifting her eyes from her magazine, the nurse lazily replied, "'Would you like to make an appointment?' "'No, that's it. That's not it. We're here to ask him about something.' She closed her magazine, looked up, and put on her glasses. "'May I ask what this is in regards to?' "'Like I said, we'd just like to ask him a few questions.' Irritated, Asakawa peered out from behind Ryuji's basket, back and asked, "'Is the doctor in?' The nurse touched the rim of her glasses with both hands and studied the two men. "'What is this about?' she asked overbearingly. Both Ryuji and Asakawa stood up straight. Ryuji said, loudly enough to be heard, "'With a receptionist like her, it's no wonder there are no patients.' "'Excuse me,' she said. Asakawa hung his head. It wouldn't do to get her angry. But just then, the door to the examination room opened, and Nagao appeared, dressed in a white lab coat. Although he was completely bald, Nagao looked rather younger than his fifty-seven years. He frowned and fixed a suspicious gaze on the two men in his entryway. Asakawa and Ryuji both turned at the sound of Nagao's voice, and instantly, when they saw his face, they gasped simultaneously. And we thought this guy might be able to tell us something about Sadako. No kidding. As if it were an electric current coursing through his brain, Asakawa found himself replaying the final scene of the video in his head. The sweating, panting face of a man seen from close up, eyes bloodshot. A gaping wound in his exposed shoulder from which blood ran, dripping into the viewer's eyes, clouding them over. A tremendous presser on the viewer's chest, murderous intent in the man's face. And that face was exactly what they saw now. Dr. Nagao. He was older now, but there was no way. Of mistaking him. Asakawa and Ryuji exchanged glances. Then Ryuji pointed at the doctor and began to laugh. <laughs> this is why games are so interesting. Who would have thought it? Imagine running into you here. Nagao was obviously displeased at the way the two strange men had reacted to seeing him. He raised his voice. Who are you? Unfazed, Ryuji walked up right to him and grabbed him by the lapels. Nagao was several centimeters taller than Ryuji. Ryuji flexed his powerful arms and pulled the doctor's ear to his mouth, and spoke in a gentle voice that belied his strength. "'So tell me, pal, what was it you did to Sadako Yamamura thirty years ago at the South Hakone Sanatorium?' It took a few seconds for the words to sink into the doctor's brain. Nagao's eyes darted around nervously as he searched his memories. Okay, um, I don't think I have a pen. Um, Hello, everyone. I, hey, 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 I have a really bad headache, baby. You don't need to hit people's head in this family. Too many people have headaches. Um, I don't have a pen, but, uh... I can't memorize. Oh, jeez. Um, are Mommy and Daddy back? Okay. Are they not ordering? They are, but they're going to go back. Okay. 
Um, well, just a minute. I'm taking a dinner ordering break. You can play some some interlude music. Da 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 da. Um. Oh my lord. I don't know. There's so much crap. Uh. Crab Rangoon. Do you like Crab Rangoon? Not that much. I like the middle of it, not the gross other parts. I think I might usually get the hibachi steak, maybe? Have we ordered from this? Yeah, we've ordered from this place. What do you guys think she should get? Oh, here we go. I'll get beef lo mein. That's what I want. There you go. Thank Ow. You, baby. I'm gonna stay in here because it's fun. I scary. don't care if it's scary. Contact, I okay. If it... the ring ghost. The ring oh ghost. heck no! Uh -huh, that's what oh, I thought. No, no, no. <laughs> it's called the ring. I didn't see the title of the book. <laughs> <sighs> Ghosts should not belong in TVs. <laughs> Ghosts. That should be the tagline of the story. Ghosts don't belong in TVs. <sighs> Mm, thank you guys. I, I feel pretty great. My diet and my change in vitamins and stuff has helped and I've been much better than normal. Today was just, I cleaned yesterday and then I didn't eat a good dinner because I was stupid and I woke up with a pretty bad headache. So I did it to myself, but it's not as bad as it used to be. It's it's passing. Normally I would be so sick I couldn't even move and I'd be in, de in bed for all day and trying not to throw up. So this is a great improvement. Okay, we were at the uh, very, very important and huge part of the reveal before we got interrupted. <laughs> it took a few seconds for the words to sink into the doctor's brain. Nagao's eyes darted around nervously as he searched his memories. Then they came to him, scenes of a time he'd never been able to forget. His knees sagged. All the strength seemed to go out of his body. Just as he was about to faint, Ryuji steadied himself and leaned him back against the wall. Nagao wasn't shocked by the memories themselves. Rather, it was the fact that the man before him, who may or may not have been thirty years old, knew about what happened. Indescribable dread pierced his soul. Doctor! exclaimed the nurse, Miss Fujimura. I think it's about time this place closed for lunch, Ryuji said, signaling to Asakawa with his eyes. Asakawa closed the curtain over the entryway so no patients would come in. Doctor! Nur Nurse Fujimura didn't know how to handle the situation. She just waited dumbly for Nagao to instruct her. Nagao somehow pulled himself together a little and thought about what to do next. Thinking that above all he couldn't let the nosy woman find out what had happened, he assumed a calm expression. Nurse Fujimura, you can take your break now. Run along and get something to eat. But doctor, do as I say. There's no need to worry about me. First, two strange men come in and whisper something in the doctor's ear, and next thing she knows, the doctor is collapsing. She didn't know what to make of all this, and so she just stood there for a few moments. Finally, the doctor shouted, Go! Now! She practically flew out the front door. Now then... Let's hear what you have to say for yourself. Ryuji went into the examination room. Nagao followed after, looking like a patient who's just been informed he has cancer. I'll warn you before we start, you mustn't lie to us. I and this gentleman here know everything. We've seen it with our very eyes. Ryuji pointed first to Asakawa, then his own eyes. What the? Seen it? Impossible. The bushes were too thick. There was nobody around. Not to mention these two are young. They wouldn't have been... I understand why you be, might be reluctant to believe me, but we both know your face all too well. Suddenly Ryuji's tone changed. Why don't I tell you what are your distinguishing features? You've still got a scar on your right shoulder, haven't you? Nagao's eyes grew wide with astonishment and his jaw started to quiver. After a pregnant pause, Ryuji said, Now shall I tell you why you have that scar on your shoulder? Ryuji leaned over and stretched his neck until his lips were almost touching Nagao's shoulder. Sadako Yamamura bit you, didn't she? Just like this. Ryuji opened his mouth and pretended to bite through the white cloth. Nagao's trembling grew worse, and he desperately tried to say something, but his mouth wouldn't work. He couldn't form words. I think you get my point. Now we're not going to repeat anything you tell us. We promise. All we want to know is everything that happened to Sadako. Not that he was in any condition to think at all, but Nagao didn't think Ryuji's words quite added up. If they'd already seen everything, why did they need to hear anything from the doctor's mouth? 
But wait, the whole idea that they saw anything is silly. They couldn't have seen anything. They probably weren't even born yet. So what's going on? What do they think they've seen? The more he thought about it, the less sense it made until his head felt like it was ready to burst. <laughs> Ryuji chuckled and looked at Asakawa. The man's eyes said it all. Frighten him like this and he'll come clean. He'll tell us anything. And indeed, Nagao began to talk. He himself was puzzled as to why he remembered everything so clearly, and as he spoke, every sensory organ in his body began to recall the excitement of that day, the passion, the heat, the touch, the glossy shine of her skin, the song of the locusts, the mingled smells of sweat and grass, and the old well. So I'm going to assume this isn't going to be great, it'll probably be horrible and evil, so just, you know, heads up there. What does pregnant pause mean? It means like a really heavy, tense pause. Have you never heard? I've, it, it's pretty, it tends to appear quite a bit in older literature, I feel like. It's not, I don't think I see it much in modern stuff. I don't even know what caused it. Here, let me, we'll switch to our tense music. How does that sound? I said tense, angry, there we go. I don't even know what caused it. Maybe the fever and headache robbed me of my ordinary good judgment. Those were the early symptoms of smallpox, which meant I'd already passed through the incubation period. But I didn't dream that I caught the disease myself. Fortunately, I managed not to infect anyone else in the sanatorium. To this day, I'm haunted by the thought of what would have happened if the tuberculosis patients had been attacked by smallpox as well. The day was a hot one. I'd been examining the tomograms of a newly admitted patient, and I found a hole the size of a one yen coin in one of his lungs. I told him to resign himself to spending a year with us, and then I'd given him a copy of the diagnosis to give his company. I couldn't take it anymore. I just had to get outside. But even breathing the fresh mountain air didn't make the pain in my head go away. So I went down the stone steps beside the ward, thinking to take shelter in the shade of the garden. Then I noticed a young woman leaning against a tree trunk, gazing at the world down below. She wasn't one of our patients. She was the daughter of a patient who'd been there long before I arrived a man named Heihachiro Ikuma, a former assistant professor at Taito University. Her name was Sadako Yamamura. I remember the name well. Her family name was different from her father's. For about a month, she'd been making frequent visits to the sanatorium, but she didn't spend much time with her father. Nor would she ask the doctors much about his condition. All I could assume was she was there to enjoy the alpine scenery. I sat next to her and smiled at her, asking how her father was doing, but she didn't look like she even wanted to know much about his illness. On the other hand, it was clear she knew he didn't have much longer. I could tell by the way she spoke. She knew the day her father was going to die with more certainty than any doctor's educated guess. Sitting there beside her family like that, beside her like that, talking to her about her life and her family, I suddenly became aware that my headache, so unbearable a little while ago, had retreated. In its place appeared a fever accompanied by an odd feeling of excitement. I felt vitality well up within me, as if the temperature of my blood had been raised. I gazed at her face. I felt what I always felt, a sense of wonder that a woman with such perfect features should exist in the world. I'm not exactly sure what defines beauty, but I know that Dr. Tanaka, who was 20 years older than me, used to say the same thing, that he'd never seen anyone more beautiful than Sadako Yamamura. My breathing was choked with fever, but somehow I controlled it enough to softly put a hand on her shoulder and say to her, let's go somewhere cooler to talk in the shade. She suspected nothing. She nodded once and started to get to her feet, and as she stood up and bent over, I saw down the front of her white blouse, her perfectly formed breasts. They were so white my whole mind was suddenly dyed milky white, and it was as if reason was taken from me in the shock. She paid no attention to my agitation, but just brushed the dust from her long skirt. Her gestures seemed so innocent and adorable. We strolled on and on through the lush forest surrounded by the droning of the cicadas. I hadn't decided on any particular destination, but my feet kept heading in a certain direction. Sweat ran down my back. I took off my shirt, leaving only my undershirt. We followed an animal track until it opened up into the side of a valley where there stood a dilapidated old house. It had probably been at least ten years since anyone had lived there. The walls were rotting and the roof looked like it would collapse at any moment. There was a well on the other side of the house, and when she saw it, she ran toward it, saying, Oh, I'm so thirsty. She bent over to look in. 
even from the outside it was obvious the well wasn't used anymore. I ran to the well too, but not to look inside. I wanted to see what Sadaku's chest as she bent over again. I placed both hands on the lip of the well and got a close look. I could feel cool, damp air rising from the dark depths of the earth to caress my face, but it couldn't take away the burning urge I felt. I didn't know where the urge came from. I think now that the smallpox fever had taken away my mechanism of control. I swear to you I had never experienced such sexual temptation before in my life. Assuming it's going to get much worse. I will skip the worst parts if we come on something horrible. I assume we're about to. <sighs> I found myself reaching out to touch that gentle swelling, and she looked up in shock. Something snapped inside me. My memories of what happens next are hazy. All I can recall are fragmentary scenes. I found myself pressing Sadako to the ground. Uh, she bites him, and... Uh, when it was over, she fixed me with an implacable gaze. Still lying on her back, she raised her knees and skillfully used her elbows to scoot backward. I thought my eyes had deceived me. Uh... Oh. Her wrinkled gray skirt had bunched up around her waist, and she made no move to cover her breasts as she backed up. A ray of sunlight fell on the point where her thighs converged, clearly illuminating a small, blackish lump. Whoa, oh! 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 Okay. I... Okay. I was confused for a second, trying to... See if this was going to something really horrible or something, but okay. I see. I see what he's about to de deal with. Okay. I don't think I want to word it the way he words it because that's a really gross way to word it. But um, essentially, she's intersex, I believe. She has male and female genitalia. Um. Yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna word it the way he does because he's kind of gross about it. But but she he discovers through assaulting her that she is intersex. Sadako was still staring at me. I was probably the first person outside her family to discover the secret of her body. Needless to say, she'd been a virgin up until a few minutes previous. It was a necessary trial if she were to go on living as a woman. I was trying to rationalize my actions. And then suddenly the words flew into my head. I'll kill you. As I reeled from the strength of will behind the words, I instantly n intuited her telepathic message was no lie. There was no room within it for a sliver of doubt. My body accepted it as a certainty. She'd kill me if I didn't kill her first. You deserve to die, so maybe take your punishment. My body's instinct for self-preservation gave me an order. I climbed back on top of her, uh, placed both hands on her slender neck, and pressed my full weight. To my surprise, there was less resistance. She narrowed her eyes with pleasure and relaxed her body, almost as if she wanted to die. I didn't wait to see if she'd stop breathing. I picked her body up and went to the well. I think my actions were beyond my will at this point. In other words, I didn't pick up her intent di didn't pick her up intending to drop her in the well. But the moment I picked her up, the round black mouth of the well caught my eye and put it in my mind to do it. Everything felt as if it was working out perfectly for me, or rather I felt as if being moved by a will beyond my own. I had a general idea of what was going to happen next. I could hear a voice in the back of my head saying this was all a dream. The well was dark, and from where I stood at the top, I couldn't see the bottom very clearly. From the smell of soil wafting up, it seemed there was a shallow accumulation of water at the bottom. I let go. Sadako's body slid down the side of the well into the earth, hitting the bottom with a splash. I stared into the well until my eyes got used to the dark, but I still couldn't see her curled up down there. Even so, I couldn't shake my uneasiness. I flung rocks and dirt into the well, trying to hide her body forever. I threw in armfuls of dirt and five or six fist-sized rocks before I couldn't do any more. The rocks hit her body, making a dull thud at the bottom of the well and stimulating my imagination. When I thought of that sickly, beautiful body being broken by stones, I couldn't go through with it. I know that doesn't make any sense. On the one hand, I desired the destruction of her body, but on the other hand, I didn't want her body to be marred. Oof. Yeah, this guy needed to be murdered. But I love Sadako even more now that she's... Oh my goodness, girl. Murder all these dudes. I love you. You deserved the world. And... Oh my god, I love you. I feel the same way about her now that I feel about Michelle from Feta Morgana. You both deserve the world and to murder all the horrible people. <sighs> so basically, he... Uh... Decided, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> saying that the smallpox made him do it, a defense I've never heard, sexually assaults her, discovers she is uh, intersex, um, and, you know, the whole 
a bunch of horrible things going on there. She says, well, hey, bitch, I'm gonna kill you, and he kills her. In self-defense, not really. So yeah, this story has been dealing with a lot of horrible things up to this point, and there's been dis- a few throws throws in there with where, like, the one guy saying that he was afraid of the director because he came across as gay, and that there's been little things in there, and it definitely, it, it, our heroes are not the heroes, and they're definitely, this story is, is showing us you know, how these guys make excuses for their behavior and, and it hurts other people. Oof. Please murder this man. When Nagao had finished speaking, Asakawa handed him the map of South Hakone Pacific Land. Where on this map would that well be? Asakawa asked urgently. It took Nagao a few moments to understand what he was being shown. <laughs> But after he was told that what had once been the sanatorium was now a restaurant, he seemed to regain his orientation. I think it was right about here, he said, pointing to a place on the map. No doubt about it, that's where Villa Log Cabin is, Asakawa said, rising. Let's go! But Ryuji was calm. Don't go... Hmm... Don't go rushing off just yet. We still have some things we need to ask this old fart. That syndrome you mentioned. Can a woman with it bear children? Nagao shook his head. No, she can't. On one other thing, when you raped Sadako Yamamura, you'd contracted smallpox, right? Nagao nodded. In which case, the last person in Japan to be infected with smallpox was Sadako Yamamura, no? It was certain that just before her death, Sadako Yamamura's body had been invaded by the smallpox virus, but she died immediately afterward. If its host perishes, a virus can't go on living. Nagao didn't know how to answer and looked down, avoiding Ryuji's gaze. He gave only a vague reply. Hey, what are you doing? We've got to get going! Asakawa was in the doorway, urging Ryuji to hurry. Shit. Hope you're happy, said Ryuji, flicking the tip of the doctor's nose with his index finger before following Asakawa. They should murder him. Um, that's an intriguing twist, too. Because now we, we have to ask the question, where did the baby boy come from? Because I'd been thinking maybe the baby boy was actually hers and they said it was someone else's to protect her. I don't know. I'm, I'm, hmm. I'm curious about what's going to come up with all that. Because the, the old lady in the video said, you're go- to Sadako, you're going to have a boy. And then the boy died. Maybe it has something to do with uh, her uterus not functioning properly or something and the baby died. Chapter 12. Oh, I can switch from... Hmm. Yeah, I've just started the whole having music to certain things thing. You know, and we're almost done with the ring, so I hadn't really set it up for that, but I thought, hey, throw it in at the end here. And that's not the piece I meant to play. I meant... That one? Are you playing? Did I delete the music? Oh, that was the problem. Has there not been music playing this whole time? Dang. My bad. Oh well. (sighs) Chapter 12. He couldn't explain it logically, but from his experience reading novels and watching trashy TV shows, he felt like he had a good idea of the kind of plot device called for now, based on the way the story had unfolded. There was a certain tempo to the unfolding. They hadn't been searching for Sadako's hiding place, but in the blink of an eye, they stumbled upon the tragedy that had befallen her in the spot where she was buried. So when Ryuji told him to stop in front of a large hardware store, Asakawa was relieved. He's thinking the same thing I am. Asakawa still couldn't imagine what a horrible task it would be. Unless it had been completely buried, finding the old well in the vicinity of Villa Log Cabin shouldn't be too difficult. Once they found it, it should be easy to bring up Sadako's remains. It sounded pretty simple. He wanted to think it would be. It was one in the afternoon. The midday sun reflected brilliantly from the hilly streets in this hot spring resort town. The brightness and the neighborhood's laid-back weekday mood clouded his imagination. It didn't occur to him that even if it were only four or five meters deep, the bottom of a well was bound to be an entirely different world world from the well-lit ground above. Nishi Nishizaki Hardware. Asakawa saw the sign and braked. There were stepladders and lawn mowers lined up in front of the store. They should be able to get everything they needed here. I'll let you do the shopping, Asakawa said, running to a nearby phone booth. He paused before entering it to take a phone card from his wallet. We don't have time to waste on phone calls. But Asakawa wasn't listening. 
grumbling, Ryuji went into the store and grabbed rope, a bucket, a shovel, a pulley block, and a high-powered flashlight. Asakawa was desperate. This might be his last chance to hear their voices. He knew full well how little time he had to waste. He only had nine hours left until his deadline. He slipped his card into the phone and dialed the number of his wife's parents' house in Ashikiga. Ashikaga. His father-in-law answered. Hello, it's Asakawa. Could you get Shizu and Yoko to the phone? Phone? He knew he was being rude, skipping the customary exchange of pleasantries. But he didn't have time to worry about his father-in-law's feelings. The man started to say something, but seemed to sense the urgency of the situation, and immediately summoned his daughter and granddaughter. Asakawa was extremely glad his mother-in-law hadn't been the one to answer. He'd never have gotten a word in edgewise. Hello? Shizu, is that you? Hearing her voice, he missed her already. Where are you? Atami, how's everything there? Oh, about the same. Yoko's having a great time with Grandma and Grandpa. Is she there? He could hear her voice. No words, just sounds as she struggled to climb up on her mother's lap to get to her father. Yoko, it's Daddy! Shizu put the receiver to Yoko's ear. Dada! Dada! He could barely hear the words, if words they were. They were all but drowned out by the sounds of her breathing into the phone or rubbing the mouthpiece against her cheek. But those noises only made him feel that much closer to her. He was overcome with the desire to leave all this behind him and hug her. Yoko, you wait there, okay? Daddy's coming soon to get you in the vroom vroom. Really? When are you getting here? Shizu had taken the phone without him realizing it. On Sunday. Right. I'll be renting a car and driving up, so let's all take a drive into the mountains to Nico or something. Really? Yoko, isn't that great? Daddy's going to take us for a drive in a car on Sunday. He felt his ears burning. Was he really in a position to make that kind of promise? A doctor was never supposed to say anything to give his patient false hope. He was supposed to do things to minimize the eventual shock as much as possible. Sounds like you've got this thing you're working on straightened out. Well, it's coming along. You promised me when this whole thing is over, you'd tell me the whole thing from the beginning. He had promised that. In exchange for her not asking any questions right now, he'd said he'd tell her all about it once it was taken care of. His wife had kept her end of the bargain. Hey, how long are you going to keep talking? Ryuji said from behind them. Asakawa turned around. Ryuji had the trunk open and was loading his purchases into the car. I'll call again. I might not be able to tonight, though. Asakawa placed his hand on the hook. If he pushed, the connection would be broken. He didn't even know why he'd called. Was it just to hear their voices, or did he have something important to tell them? But he knew that even if he'd been able to talk to her for an hour, when the time came to hang up, he'd still feel constrained, as if he'd only said half of what he wanted to say. It'd just be the same thing. He pressed down on the hook and let go. In any case, everything would be clear tonight at ten. Tonight at ten. Driving up in the daytime like this, South Hakone Pacific Land felt like a typical mountain resort. The creepy mood he'd felt last time came was, was hidden by the sunlight. Even the sound of bouncing tennis balls was normal, not sluggish and sonorous like before, but crisp and light. They could see Mount Fuji, hazy and white, and below them in the distance scattered flashes of sun from greenhouse roofs. It was a weekday afternoon, and Villa Log Cabin appeared deserted. It seemed that the only time the rental units were fully occupied was weekends in the summer vacation season. B4 was vacant today, too. Leaving Ryuji to check in, Asakawa unloaded the car and changed into lighter clothes. He looked carefully around the room. A week ago this evening, Asakawa had fled in fear from this haunted house. He remembered running into the bathroom to throw up, feeling he was about to piss himself. He could even remember quite vividly the graffiti he'd seen on the bathroom wall when he'd knelt down in front of the toilet. Now he opened the bathroom door, the same graffiti in the same place. It was just after two. They went out into the balcony and ate the box lunches they'd bought on the way while gazing over the grassy meadow surrounding the cabins. The fretful mood that had shadowed them here from Nagao's clinic subsided a bit. Even amidst the worst panic, there are still scattered moments like this when time leisurely flows by. Even when trying to finish a story by an impending deadline, Asakawa would sometimes find himself aimlessly watching coffee drops from the spout of the coffee maker, and later he'd reflect on how elegantly he'd wasted precious time. Eat up, we'll need our strength, said Ryuji. He'd brought two lunches just for himself. Asakawa, meanwhile, didn't seem to have much appetite. From time to time, he'd rest his chopsticks and look back inside the cabin. Suddenly he spoke, as if he'd just, it just occurred to him. Maybe we'd better get this straight. What exactly are we doing here? We're going to look for Sadako, of course. And what do we do once we've found her? Take her back to Sashikiji and lay her to rest. So that's the charm. You're saying that's what she wants. 
Ryuji chewed loudly for a while on a big mouthful of rice, eyes staring straight ahead, unfocused. Asakawa could tell from the look on his face Ryuji wasn't entirely convinced either. Asakawa was scared. It was his last chance, and he wanted some sort of reassurance they were doing the right thing. There were to be no second chances. "'There's nothing else we can do now,' said Ryuji, tossing away his empty lunchbox. "'What about this possibility? Maybe she wants us to clear away her resentment toward the person who killed her. You mean Jotaro Nagao? You mean if we exposed him, Sadako would be appeased?' Asakawa looked deep into Ryuji's eyes, trying to figure out what he really thought. If they dug up the remains and laid them to rest, and it still didn't save Asakawa's life, maybe Ryuji was planning to kill Dr. Nagao. Maybe he was using Asakawa as a test case, trying to save his own skin. "'Come on, don't be stupid,' said Ryuji with a laugh. First of all, if Nagao had really incurred Sadako's resentment, he'd already be dead. True, she definitely had that kind of power. So why did she let herself be killed by him? I can't say, but look... She was surrounded by the deaths of people close to her. She knew nothing but frustration. Even disappearing from the theater company like that was essentially a frustration of her goals, right? Then she visits her father at the sanatorium and finds out he's near death. A person who's given up on the world harbors no resentment towards the person who takes her out of it, is that what you're saying? Not exactly. Rather, I think it's possible that Sadako herself caused the impulses in old man Nagao. In other words, maybe she killed herself, but borrowed Nagao's hands to do it. Her mother had thrown herself into a volcano, her father was dying of tuberculosis, her own dreams of becoming an actress had been shattered, and there was her congenital handicap. She had any number of reasons to commit suicide. And there were things that just didn't add up unless one assumed she'd kill herself. Yoshino's report had mentioned Shigemori, founder of theater group Soaring. He'd gotten drunk and dropped in on Sadako and died the next day of cardiac paralysis. It was almost certain Sadako had killed him, using some abnormal ability of hers. She had that kind of power. She could easily kill a man or two without leaving any evidence. So why was Nagao still alive? It made no sense unless one decided she must have guided his will in order to kill herself. Well, okay, let's say it was suicide. Why did she have to be raped before she died? Don't tell me it's because she didn't want to die a virgin. Asakawa had hit the nail on the head, and as a result, Ryuji was at a loss for an answer. That was exactly what he was going to say. Is it really so stupid? Huh? Is it really so foolish to not want to die a virgin? Ryuji pressed his point with a desperate earnestness. If it were me, if by some chance it were me, that's how I'd feel. I wouldn't want to die a virgin. This wasn't exactly like Ryuji, Asakawa felt. Asakawa couldn't explain it logically, but neither the words nor the facial expression were like Ryuji at all. Are you serious? Men and women are different, especially in the case of Sadako. <laughs> Just kidding. Of course she didn't want to be raped. I mean, who'd want a thing like that to happen to oneself? Plus, she bit Nagao's shoulder down to the bone. It was only after it happened the thought of dying occurred to her, and without even considering it, she guided Nagao in that direction. I think that's probably what happened. But then wouldn't you still expect her to have lingering resentment toward Nagao? Asakawa still wasn't convinced. But aren't you forgetting? We need to imagine the spear tip of her resentment being pointed not at one any individual, but at society in general. Compared to that, her hatred of Nagao was as insignificant as a fart in a windstorm. If hatred towards society in general was what was incorporated into the video, then what was the charm? What could it be? The phrase, indiscriminate attack, came into Asakawa's mind before Ryuji's thick voice interrupted his thoughts. Enough already. If we have time to think about crap like this, we should be spending it trying to find Sadako. She's the one who will solve every riddle. Ryuji drained the last of his oolong tea and stood up and tossed the empty can out toward the valley floor. They stood on the gentle hillside looking around at the tall grass. Ryuji handed Asakawa a sickle and pointed with his chin to the slope on the left side of B4. He wanted him to cut away the tangle of grass and examine the contours of the ground there. Asakawa bent down, dropped his knee, and began to sing swing the sickle in an arc parallel to the ground. Grass began to fall. Thirty years before, a dilapidated house had stood here with a well in its front yard. Asakawa stood up again. He looked around again, wondering where he'd build his dwelling if he were to live here. He'd probably choose a site with a nice view. There was no other reason to build a house up here. Where was the best view? Eyes trained on the greenhouse roof shining far below, Asakawa walked around a bit, paying attention to the shifting perspective. The view didn't seem to change much, no matter where he went. But he thought that if he were building a house, it would be easier to build it where cabin A4 stood than where B4 was. When he bent down to the ground and looked, he realized this was the only level area. He crawled around in the space between A4 and B4, cutting the grass and feeling the earth with his hands. 
He had no memory of ever drawing water from a well. He realized he'd never even seen a real well. He had no idea what one really looked like, especially in a mountainous area like this. Was there really groundwater here? But then a few hundred meters east along the floor of the valley, there was a patch of marsh surrounded by tall trees. Asakawa's thoughts weren't coming together. Was, what was he supposed to concentrate on during a task like this? No idea. He felt the blood rush to his head. He looked at his watch, almost three o'clock. Seven hours left. Would all this effort get them any closer to meeting the deadline? The thought sent his mind into further disarray. The image of the well was hazy. What would remain to mark the site of an old well? A bunch of stones piled up in a circle? What if they'd collapsed and fallen into the earth? No way! Then they'd never make it in time. He looked at his watch again, exactly three now. He'd just drunk 500 milliliters of oolong tea on the balcony, but it's already his throat was dry again. Voices echoed in his head. Look for a bulge in the earth. Excuse me. Look for rocks. He jabbed the shovel into the exposed dirt. Time and blood assaulted his brain. His nerves were shot, but he didn't feel fatigued. Why was time flowing so differently now than when it was on the... Excuse me. Than when they were on the balcony eating lunch. Why had he started to panic so much the minute he'd set to work? Was this the right thing to do, really? Weren't there a lot of other things they should be doing? He dug a cave once as a child. He must have been in the fourth or fifth grade. He laughed weakly as he recalled the episode. What in the world are you doing? At the sound of Ryuji's voice, Asakawa's head jerked up. What have you been up to crawling over around here? We've got to search a wider area. Asakawa gaped up at Ryuji. Ryuji had the sun at his back. His face was shadowy. Drops of sweat from his dark face fell to the grass by his feet. What was I up to? A little hole had been dug in the ground right in front of him. Asakawa had dug it. You dig in a pit or something? Ryuji sighed. Asakawa frowned and moved to look at his watch. Stop looking at your fucking watch! Ryuji slapped his hand away. He glared at Asakawa for a little while, then sighed again. He squatted and whispered calmly, Maybe you ought to take a break. No time. I'm telling you, you need to get a hold of yourself. Panicking won't get you anywhere. Asakawa was crouching too, and Ryuji poked him lightly in the chest. Asakawa lost his balance and fell over backward, feet up in the air. That's it, lie down like that, just like a baby. Asakawa squirmed, trying to get to his feet. Don't move, lie down. Don't waste your strength. Ryuji stepped on Asakawa's chest until he stopped struggling. Asakawa closed his eyes and gave up resisting. The weight of Ryuji's foot receded into the distance. When he gently opened his eyes again, Ryuji was moving his short, powerful legs crossing over into the shade of B4's balcony. His gait was eloquent. He'd had an inspiration as to where they could find the well, and his sense of desperation had faded. After Ryuji had left, Asakawa lay still for a while. Flat on his back, spread eagled, he gazed into the sky. The sun was bright. How weak his spirit was compared to Ryuji's. Disgusting. He regulated his breathing and tried to think coolly. He wasn't confident he could keep himself together as the next seven hours ticked away. He'd just follow Ryuji's every order. That'd be best. Lose himself. Place himself under the sway of someone with an unyielding spirit. Lose yourself. You'll even be able to escape the terror then. You're going to be buried in the earth. You'll become one with nature. As if in answer to his wish, he was suddenly overcome by drowsiness and began to lose consciousness. At the very threshold of sleep in the midst of a daydream about lifting Yoko high into the air, he remembered once again that episode from his grey school days. There was a municipal sports ground on the outskirts of the town he'd grown up in. There was a cliff at its edge, and at the foot of the cliff was a swamp with crayfish in it. When he was a schoolboy, Asakawa often went there with his buddies to catch crayfish. On that particular day, the sun shining on the exposed red earth of the cliff next to the swamp was like a challenge. He was tired of sitting there holding his fish pole anyway, so he went over to where the sun was shining on the cliff and began to dig a hole in its steep face. The dirt was soft clay, and as it crumbled away at his feet when he thrust in an old piece of board his, he found, before long his friends joined him. There had been three of them, he seemed to recall, or maybe four. Just the perfect number for digging a cave. Any more, and they would have been bumping heads. Any fewer, and it would have been too much work. After an hour of digging, they'd made a hole the right size for one of them to crawl into. They kept going. They'd originally been on their way home from school, and soon one of his friends said he had to be getting home. Only Asakawa, whose idea it had been in the first place, kept at it silently. And by the time the sun set, the cave had grown large enough for all the boys who were left to squeeze into. Asakawa had hugged his knees. He and his friends giggled at each other. Curled up in the red clay like that, they felt like the Stone Age people at Mikabi, whose remains they'd just learned about in social studies. 
After a little while, the entrance to the hole was blocked by a lady's face. The setting sun was at her back, so the face was in shadow, and they couldn't make out her expression. But they realized it was a fifty-ish housewife from the neighborhood. "'What are you boys doing digging a hole here? It'd be pretty disgusting if you got buried alive in there,' the lady said, peering into the cave. Asakawa and the two other boys exchanged glances. Young though they were, they still noticed something odd about her warning. Not, cut it out, that's dangerous. But cut it out, because if you got buried alive and died, it would be disgusting to people in the neighborhood like me. She was cautioning them purely for her own good. Asakawa and his friends began to giggle again. The lady's face blocked the entrance like a figure in a shadow play. Ryuji's face gradually superimposed itself over the lady's. Now you're a bit too relaxed. Imagine being able to go night-night in a place like this. Hey, you jerk, what are you giggling at? Ryuji woke him up. The sun was nearing the western horizon, and darkness was fast approaching. Ryuji's face and figure against the weakening sunlight were even blacker than before. Come over here a minute. Ryuji pulled Asakawa to his feet and silently crawled back under the balcony of B4. Asakawa followed. Under the balcony, one of the boards between the supporting pillars had been peeled part, part way back. Ryuji stuck his hand in behind the board and pulled it out with all his might. With a loud snap, the board broke half in half diagonally. The decor inside the cabin was modern, but these boards were so flimsy you could break them by hand. The builders had thoroughly skimped on the parts you couldn't see. Ryuji poked the flashlight inside and shined it around under the cabinet. He nodded as if to say, come look at this. Asakawa fixed his gaze on the gap in the wall and looked inside. The flashlight beam was trained on a black protrusion over by the west side. As he stared at it, he noticed that the sides seemed to have an uneven texture, like a pile of rocks. The top was covered with a concrete lid. Blades of grass poked out of some of the cracks in the concrete and between the stones. Asakawa immediately realized what was directly overhead, the living room of the cabin, and directly over the round rim of the well were the television and VCR. A week ago, when he'd watched that video, Sadako Yamamura had been this close, hiding, watching what went on above. Ryuji pulled off more boards until there was an opening large enough for a man to pass through. They both ducked through the hole in the wall and crawled to the rim of the well. The cabin was built on a gradient, and they'd entered from the downhill end, so the further they went, the lower the floorboards got, creating a sense of something pressing down on them. Even though there should be plenty of air in the dark crawl space, Asakawa began to find it hard to breathe. The soil here was clammier than outside. Asakawa knew full well what they must do now. He knew but felt no fear yet. He felt claustrophobic just from the floorboards over his head, but maybe he'd have to go down into the bottom of the well, into a place ruled by an even deeper darkness. Not maybe. To pull Sadako out, they'd almost certainly have to descend into the well. "'Give me a hand here,' said Ryuji. He'd grabbed a piece of rebar poking out from a crack in the concrete lid and was trying to pull the lid down onto the slope. But the ceiling was too low and he couldn't get much leverage. Even someone like Ryuji, who could bench 120 kilos, was down to half strength if he didn't have the right footing. Asakawa went around the well until he was uphill from it and lay down on his back. He placed both hands on a support column to brace himself and pushed against the lid with his feet. There was an ugly sound as concrete scraped against stone. Asakawa and Ryuji began to chant in order to synchronize their efforts. The lid moved. How many years had it been since the well's face was exposed? Had the well been capped when Villa Log Cabin was built, or when Pacific Land was established, or when the sanatorium closed? They could only guess, based on the strength of the seal between the concrete and the stones, on the almost human screech as the lid was torn away. Probably more than just six months or a year, but no longer than twenty-five years. In any case, the well was just started to open its mouth. Ryuji stuck the blade of the shovel into the space they'd made so far and pushed. Okay, when I give you the signal, I want you to lean on the handle. Asakawa turned around. Ready? One, two, three, push! As Asakawa leaned on the makeshift lever, Ryuji pushed on the side of the cap with both hands. With an agonized shriek, the lid fell to the ground. The lip of the well was faintly damp. Asakawa and Ryuji picked up their flashlights, placed their other hands on the wet rim, and pulled themselves up. Before shining light into the well, they moved their heads and shoulders into the roughly 50-centimeter gap between the top of the well and the floor above. A putrid smell arose on the cold air. The space inside the well was so dense they felt if they let their hands go, they'd be sucked in. She was here all right. The woman with extraordinary supernatural power. Mm. More transphobic BS. 
Basically, he sa he starts thinking about how he's not even sure he should call her a woman. Of course he should. Screw him. Hmm. Let's see. Which part here? This morning on the boat, Ryuji had said, Don't you think a person with both male and female genitals is the ultimate power of symbol and beauty? Come to think of it, Asakawa had once seen something in an art book that made him doubt his eyes. A perfectly mature female nude reclining on a slab of stone, with a splendid example of male genitalia peeking out between her thighs. Can you see anything? asked Ryuji. The beams of their flashlight showed the water had collected in the bottom of the well, about four or five meters down, but, it, they, but they didn't know how deep the water was. There's water down there, Ryuji scuffed around, tying the end of the rope to a post. Okay, point your flashlight downward and hold it over the edge. Don't drop it, whatever you do. He's planning to go in there. As he realized this, Asakawa's legs began to shake. What if I have to go down? Now, finally, with the narrow vertical tunnel staring him in the face, Asakawa's imagination started to work on him. I can't do it. Go into that black water and do what? Fish around for bones, that's what! There's no way I can do that, I'll go crazy! As he gratefully watched Ryuji lower himself into the hole, he prayed to God his turn would never come. His eyes were accustomed to the dark now, and he could see the moss covering the inner surface of the well. The stones of the wall and the orange beam of his flashlight seemed to turn into eyes and noses and mouths, and when he couldn't tear his gaze away, the patterns of the stones transformed into dead faces, distorted with demonic cries at the moments of their death. Innumerable evil spirits undulated like seaweed hands outstretched toward the exit. He couldn't drive away the image. A pebble fell into the ghastly shaft, barely a meter across, echoed against the sides of the well, and was swallowed into the gullets of the evil spirits. Ryuji wormed his body into the space between the top of the well and the floorboards, wrapped his, the rope around his hands, and slowly let himself down. Soon he was standing on the bottom. His legs were submerged to his knees. It wasn't very deep. Asakawa, go get the bucket, and the thin rope, too. The bucket was where they'd left it on the balcony. Asakawa crawled out from underneath the cabin. It was dark outside, but it still felt far brighter than underneath the foundation. What a feeling of release! So much pure air! He looked around at the cabins. Only A1 by the road emitted any light. He made a point of not looking at his watch. The warm, friendly voices spilling from A1 seemed to constitute a separate world floating in the distance. They were the sounds of dinner time. He didn't have to look at his watch to know what time it must be. He returned to the lip of the well where he tied the bucket and shovel to the end of the rope and lowered them down. Ryuji shoveled earth from the bottom of the well into the bucket. From time to time he'd crouch and run his fingers through the mud searching for something, but he didn't find anything. Haul the bucket up, he shouted. With his belly braced against the edge of the well, Asakawa pulled up the bucket, then dumped the mud and rocks onto the ground before lowering the empty bucket back into the well. It seemed quite a bit of dirt and sand had drifted into the well before it had been sealed. Ryuji dug and dug, but without turning up Sadako's beautiful limbs. Hey, Asakawa! Ryuji paused in his labors and looked up. Asakawa didn't reply. Asakawa! Something wrong up there? Asakawa wanted to reply, Nothing's wrong. I'm fine. You haven't said a word this whole time. At least, you know, call out encouragement or something. I'm getting a bit melancholy down here. Asakawa said nothing. Well then, how about a song? Something by Hibari Misora, maybe? Asakawa still said nothing. Asakawa, are you still there? I know you didn't faint on me. I'm... I'm fine, he managed to mutter. You're a right pain in the ass, that's what you are. Ryuji spat out the words and jammed the tip of the shovel into the water. How many times had he done this now? The water level was slowly dropping, but still there was no sign of what they were looking for. He could see the bucket climbing more and more slowly. Then finally it stopped. Asakawa let it slip out of his hands. He'd had it raised about half the height of the well, and now it plunged down again. Ryuji managed to avoid a direct hit, but he got splashed from head to toe with muddy water. Along with anger came the realization that Asakawa was at the limit of his strength. Son of a bitch! Are you trying to kill me? Ryuji climbed up the rope. Your turn. My turn. Shocked, Asakawa stood, banging his head hard on the floorboards in the process. Wait, Ryuji, it's okay. I'm all right. I've still got strength left, Asakawa stammered. Ryuji poked his head out of the well. No, you haven't. Now, not an ounce. Your turn. Just, just hold on. Let me catch my wind. We'd be here till dawn. Ryuji shined the light in Asakawa's face. There was a strange look in his eyes. Fear of death had stolen his reason. 
One long look told Ryuji Asakawa was no longer capable of rational judgment. Between shoveling muddy water into a bucket and hauling that bucket four or five meters straight up, it didn't take much to see which was the harder job. Down you go! Ryuji pushed Asakawa toward the well. No, wait! I... I... What? I'm claustrophobic! Don't be silly. Asakawa continued to cringe, unmoving. The water at the bottom of the well trembled slightly. I can't do it. I can't go down there. Ryuji grabbed Asakawa by the collar and slapped him twice. Snap out of it! I can't go down there. You've got death staring you in the face, and you might be able to do something about it, and now you say you can't. Don't be a worm. It's not just your own life at stake here, you know. Remember that phone call? You ready to take sweet babykins down into the darkness with you? He thought about his wife and daughter. He couldn't afford to be a coward. He held their lives in his hands. But his body wouldn't obey him. Is this really going to work, though? But there was no purpose in his voice. He knew it was pointless to even ask the question now. Ryuji relaxed his grip on the collar. Shall I tell you a little more about Professor Miura's theory? There are three conditions that have to be met in order for a malevolent will to remain in the world after death. An enclosed space, water, and a slow death. One, two, three. In other words, if someone dies slowly in an enclosed place with water present, usually that person's angry spirit will haunt the place. Now look at the well. It's small, enclosed place with water, and remember what the old lady in the video said. How has your health been since then? If you spend all your time playing in water, monsters are bound to get you. Playing in the water. That was it. Sadako was down there under that black muddy water, playing even now. An endless, watery, underground game. You see, Sadako was still alive when she was dropped into this well, and when she waited for death, she coated the very walls with her hatred. All three were met in her- all three conditions were met in her case. So? So according to Professor Miura, it's easy to exercise such a curse. We just free her. We take her bones out of this nasty old well, have a nice memorial service, and lay her to rest in the soil of her native place. We bring her up into the bright wide world. A while before, when he'd crawled out from under the cabin to get the bucket, Asakawa had felt an indescribable sense of liberation. Were they supposed to provide Sadako with the same thing? Was that what she wanted? So that's the charm? Maybe it is, and maybe it isn't. That's pretty vague. Ryuji grabbed Asakawa's collar again. Think! There's nothing certain in our future. All we can hope for is a vague continuation. But in spite of that, you're going to keep on living. You can't give up on life because it's vague. It's a question of possibilities. The charm? There might be a lot of other things Sadako wants, but there's a good possibility taking her remains out of here will break the curse of the video. Asakawa twisted his face and screamed silently. Enclosed space, water, and slow death, he says. These three conditions allow the strongest survival of an evil spirit, he says. Where is the proof that anything that fraud Miura said is true? If you understand me, you'll go down into the well. But I don't understand. How can I understand something like this? You don't have time to dwaddle. Your deadline is almost here. Ryuji's voice grew gradually kinder. Don't think you can overcome death without a fight. Asshole, I don't want to hear your philosophy of life. But he finally began to climb over the rim of the well. boy, finally think you can do it? Asakawa clung to the rope and lowered himself down the inner wall of the well. Ryuji's face was before his eyes. Don't worry, there's nothing down there. Your biggest enemy is your imagination. When he looked up, the beam of the flashlight hit him full in the face, blinding him. He pressed his back against the wall. His grip on the rope began to loosen. His feet slipped against the stones, and he suddenly dropped about a meter. His hands burned from the friction. He was dangling above the surface of the water, but couldn't make himself go in. He extended one foot, putting it in the water up to his ankle, as if he were testing the temperature of a bath. With the cold touch of the water came goose flesh from the tips of his toes to his spine, and he immediately retracted his foot. But his arms were too tired to keep hanging on the rope. His weight pulled him slowly down, and eventually he couldn't endure any more, so he planted both feet. Immediately, the soft dirt below the water enveloped his feet, submerging them. Asakawa still clung to the rope in front of his eyes. He started to panic. He felt as if a forest of hands were reaching up from the earth to pull him into the mud. The walls were closing in on all sides, leering at him. There's no escape. Ryuji, he tried to scream, but he couldn't find his voice. He couldn't breathe. Only a faint, dry sound escaped his throat, and he looked upward like a drowning child. He felt something warm trickle down the inside of his thighs. 
Asakawa, breathe! Overcome by the pressure, Asakawa had forgotten to breathe. It's all right, I'm here. Ryuji's voice echoed down to him, and Asakawa managed to suck in a lungful of air. He couldn't control the pounding of his heart. He couldn't do what he needed to do here. Desperately, he tried to think of something else, something more pleasant. If this well had been outside, under a sky full of stars, it wouldn't be this horrible. It was because it was covered by the cabin that it was hard to take. It cut off the escape route. Even with the concrete lid gone, there were only floorboards and spider webs above. Sadako Yamamura has lived down here for 25 years. That's right, she's down here, right under my feet. This is a tomb, that's what it is, a tomb. He couldn't think of anything else. Thought itself was closed off to him as any kind of escape. Sadako had tragically ended her life down here, and the scenes that had flashed through her mind at the moment of her death had remained here, still strong through the power of her psyche. And they'd matured down here in this cramped hole, breathing like the ebb and flow of the tide, waxing and waning in strength according to some cycle that had at some point coincided in frequency with the television placed directly overhead. And then they'd made their appearance in the world. Sadako was breathing. From out of nowhere the sound of breathing enclosed him. Sadako Yamamura. Sadako Yamamura. The syllables repeated themselves in his brain, and her terrifyingly beautiful face came to him out of the photographs, shaking her head coquettishly. Sadako Yamamura was here. As Asakawa reluctantly. Yeah. I need water. Asakawa recklessly began to dig through the earth beneath him, searching for her. He thought of her pretty face and her body trying to cover that image. That beautiful girl's bones covered in my piss. Asakawa moved the shovel, sifting through the mud. Time no longer mattered. He'd taken off his watch before coming down here. Extreme fatigue and stress had deadened his vexation, and he forgot the deadline he was laboring under. It felt like being drunk. He had no sense of time. Only by the frequency with which the bucket came back down to the well to him, and by the beating of his heart did he have any way of measuring time. Finally, Asakawa grasped a large, round rock with both hands. It was smooth and pleasant to the touch, with two holes in its surface. He lifted it out of the water. He washed the dirt out of its recesses. He picked it up by what mu must once have been ear holes, and found himself face to face with a skull. His imagination clothed it with flesh. Big, clear eyes returned to the deep, hollow sockets, and flesh appeared above the two holes in the middle, forming itself into an elegant nose. Her long hair was wet, and water dripped from her neck and from behind her ears. Sadako Yamamura blinked her melancholy eyes two or three times to shake the water from her eyelashes. Squeezed between Asakawa's hands, her face looked painfully distorted, but still her beauty was unclouded. She smiled at Asakawa, then narrowed her eyes as if to focus her vision. I've been wanting to meet you. As he thought this, Asakawa slumped down right where he was. He could hear Ryuji's voice from far overhead. Asakawa, wasn't your deadline 10.04? Rejoice, it's 10.10. Asakawa, can you hear me? You're still alive, right? The curse is broken. We're saved! Asakawa, if you die down there, you'll end up like her. If you die, don't put a curse on me, okay? If you're going to die, die nice, would you? Asakawa, if you're alive, answer me, damn it! He heard Ryuji, but he didn't really feel saved. He curled up as if in a dream, as if in another world, clutching Sadako Yamamura's skull to his chest. Let's see here, we got... Hmm, we got section four left, and it is about... Uh, 67... It's like 20, 30 pages? I think we can finish it. We'll go ahead and finish it. I'm gonna finish off these in freezing cold eggs real quick. <laughs> saved, right? Yay! from the manager.
manager's office woke Asakawa from his slumber. The manager was reminding them that checkout was at 11 a.m. and asking if they'd prefer to stay another night. Asakawa reached out with his free hand and picked up the watch beside his pillow. His arms were tired, just lifting them was an effort. They didn't hurt yet, but they'd probably ache like hell tomorrow. He wasn't wearing his glasses, so he couldn't read the time until he brought the watch right up to his eyes. A few minutes past 11. Asakawa couldn't think of how to reply right away. He didn't even know where he was. Will you be staying another night? asked the manager, trying to suppress his annoyance. Ryuji groaned right beside him. This wasn't his own room, that's for sure. It was as if the whole world had been repainted without his knowing it. The thick line connecting past to present and present to future had been cut into two before his sleep and after it. Hello? Now the manager was worried that there was nobody on the other end of the line. Without even knowing why, Asakawa felt joy flood his breath. breast. Ryuji rolled over and opened his eyes slightly. He was drooling. Asakawa's memories were hazy. All he found when he searched his recollections was darkness. He could more or less remember visiting Dr. Nagao and heading for Villa Log Cabin, but everything after that was vague. Dark scenes came to him one after another and his breath caught in his throat. He felt like he did after waking up from a powerful dream. Thank you for reminding me. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, he felt like he did after waking up from a powerful dream, one that left a strong impression even though he'd forgotten what it was about. For some reason, his spirits were high. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Asakawa finally managed to reply, adjusting his grip on the receiver. Checkout time is 11 o'clock. Uh, got it. We'll get our things together and leave right away. Asakawa adopted an officious tone to match the manager's. He could hear a faint trickle of water from the kitchen. It seemed someone hadn't turned the faucet tight last night before going to sleep. Asakawa hung up the phone. Ryuji had closed his eyes again. Asakawa shook him. Hey, Ryuji, get up. He had no idea how long they'd slept. Ordinarily, Asakawa slept no more than five or six hours a night, but now he felt like he'd been asleep for much longer than that. It had been a long time since he'd been able to sleep soundly untroubled. Hey, Ryuji, if we don't get out of here, they're going to charge us for another night. Asakawa shook Ryuji harder, but he didn't wake up. Asakawa raised his eyes and saw the milky white plastic bag on the dining room table. Suddenly, as if some chance happening had brought back a fragment of a dream, he remembered what was inside it. Calling Sadako's name, pulling her out of the cold earth under the floor, stuffing her into a plastic bag. The sound of running water. It had been Ryuji last night who'd gone to the sink and washed the mud from Sadako. The water was still running. By then, the appointed time had already passed, and even now, Asakawa was still alive. He was overjoyed. Death had been breathing down his neck, and now it had been cleared away. Life seemed more concentrated. It began to glow. Sadako's skull was beautiful like a marble sculpture. Ryuji, wake up! Suddenly, he got a bad feeling. Something caught in the corner of his mind. He put his ear to Ryuji's chest. He wanted to hear Ryuji's heart beating through his thick sweatshirt to know he was still alive. But just as his ear was about to touch Ryuji's chest, Asakawa suddenly found himself in a headlock. Held by two powerful hands, Asakawa panicked and started to struggle. Gotcha! Thought I was dead, didn't you? Ryuji released his grip on Asakawa's head and laughed an odd, childlike laugh. How could he joke around after what they'd been through? Anything was liable to happen. If at that instant he'd seen Sadako Yamamura alive and standing by the table, and Ryuji tearing his hair dry, tearing at his hair drying, Asakawa would have believed his eyes. He suppressed his anger. He owed Ryuji a great deal. Stop fooling around. It's payback time. You scared the bejesus out of me last night. Still on his side, Ryuji began to chuckle. What did I do? You collapsed down there at the bottom of the well. I really thought you'd gone and died. I was worried. Time was up. I thought you were out of the game. Asakawa said nothing, just blinked several times. You don't even remember, ungrateful bastard. Now that he thought about it, Asakawa couldn't remember crawling out of the well on his own. Finally, he recalled dangling from the rope, his strength totally spent. Hauling 60 kilogram, 4 foot frame meters, 5 meters straight up couldn't have been easy, even for someone of Ryuji's strength. The image of himself hanging suspended reminded him somehow of the stone statue of Inno Ozuno being pulled up from the bottom of the sea. Shizuko had gained mysterious powers for fishing out the statue, but all Ryuji had to show for his troubles were aches and pains. Ryuji, asked Asakawa in a strangely altered voice. What? Thanks for everything you've done. I really owe you. Don't start getting mushy on me. If it hadn't been for you, I'd be... well, you know. Anyway, thanks. Cut the crap, you're gonna make me puke. 
Gratitude isn't worth a single yen. Well, then how about some lunch? I'm buying. Oh, well, in that case... Ryuji pulled himself to his feet, staggering a little. All of his muscles were stiff. Even Ryuji was having trouble making his body do what he wanted it to. From the South Hakone Pacific Land Rest House, Asakawa called his wife in Ashikaga and told her he'd pick her up in a rental car Sunday morning as promised. So everything's all taken care of, she asked? All Asakawa could say was probably. From the fact he was still here alive, he could only guess things were resolved. But as he hung up the phone, something still bothered him deeply. He couldn't quite get over it. Just from the mere fact he was alive, he wanted to believe everything was wrapped up neatly, but... Thinking Ryuji might have the same doubts, Asakawa walked back to the table and asked, This is the end, right? Ryuji had wolfed down his lunch while Asakawa was on the phone. Your family doing all right? Ryuji wasn't going to answer Asakawa's question right away. Yeah, Ryuji, are you feeling like it's not over yet? You worried? Aren't you? Maybe. About what? What bothers you? What the old woman said. Next year, you're going to have a child. That prediction of hers. The moment he realized Ryuji had the exact same doubts, Asakawa turned to try to dispel those doubts. Maybe the you that once was referring to Shizuko instead of Sadako. Ryuji rejected this straight away. Not possible. The images on that video come from Sadako's own eyes and mind. The old woman was talking to her. You can only refer to Sadako. Maybe her prediction was false? Sadako's ability to foresee the future should have been infallible, 100%. But Sadako was physically incapable of bearing children. That's why it's so strange. And she was a virgin until right before she died, and... And? Her first sexual experience was Nagao, the last smallpox victim in Japan. A coincidence. It was said in the distance past that gods and devils, cells and viruses, male and female, and even light and darkness had been identical, with no internal contradiction. Asakawa began to feel uneasy. Once the discussion moved into the realm of genetic structures or the cosmos before the creation of the Earth, the answers were beyond the pale of individual questioning. All he could do at this point was pers to persuade himself to dispel the niggling uncertainties in his heart and tell himself it was all over. But I'm alive. The riddle of the erased charm is solved. The case is closed. Then Asakawa realized something. Hadn't the statue of En no Ozunu willed itself to be pulled up from the bottom of the ocean? That will had worked on Shizuko, guiding her actions, and as a result, she was given her new power. Suddenly, the pattern looked awfully familiar. Bringing Sadako's bones up from the bottom of the well, fishing En no Ozuno's statue up from the ocean floor. But what bothered him was the irony. The power Shizuko was given brought her only misery. But that was looking at things the wrong way. Maybe in Asakawa's case, simply being released from the curse was the equivalent of Shizuko receiving power. Asakawa decided to make himself think so. Ryuji glanced at Asakawa's face, reassuring himself that the man before him was indeed alive, and then nodded twice. I suppose you have a point. Exhaling slowly, he sank back into the chair. And yet... What? Ryuji sat up straight and asked, as if to himself. What did Sadako give birth to? Asakawa and Ryuji parted company at Atami Station. Asakawa intended to take Sadako's remains back to her relatives in Sashikiji and have them hold a memorial service for her. They probably wouldn't even know what to do with her, a distant relative they hadn't heard a peep of out of in nearly 30 years. But things being what they were, he couldn't abandon her. If he hadn't known who she was, he could have had her buried as a Jane Doe. But he knew, and so all he could do was hand her over to the people in Sashikiji. The Statue of Limitations was long past, and it would be do nothing but trouble to bring up a murder now. So he decided to say she probably had been a suicide. He wanted to hand her off and return immediately to Tokyo, but the boat didn't depart that often. Leaving now, he'd end up having to spend the night on Oshima. Since he'd have to leave the rental car on Atami, flying back to Tokyo would just make things more complicated. You can deliver her bones all by yourself. You don't need me for that. As he'd said this, getting out of the car in front of Atami Station, Ryuji seemed to be laughing at Asakawa. Sadako's bones were no longer in the plastic bag. They were wrapped neatly in a black cloth in the back seat of the car. To be sure, it was such a small bundle that even a child could have delivered it to the Yamamura house in Sashikiji. The point was to get them to accept her. If they refused, Asakawa wouldn't have anywhere to take her. That would be troublesome. He had the feeling the charm would only be completed fully when someone close to her held services for her. But still, why should they believe him when he showed up on their doorstep with a bag of bones, saying this is your relative whom you haven't heard from in 25 years? What proof did he have? 
Asakawa was still a little worried. Well, happy trails. See you in Tokyo. Ryuji we waved and went through the ticket gate. If I didn't have so much work, I wouldn't mind tagging along, but you know how it is. Ryuji had a mountain of work, scholarly articles and the like that needed immediate attention. Let me thank you again. Forget about it. It was fun for me, too. Asakawa watched until Ryuji disappeared into the shadow of the stairs leading to the platform. Just before disappearing from view, Ryuji stumbled on the steps. Although he quickly regained his balance, for a brief moment as he swayed, Ryuji's muscular form seemed to go double in Asakawa's vision. Asakawa realized he was tired and rubbed his eyes. When he took his hand away, Ryuji had disappeared up the stairs. A curious sensation pierced his breast, and somewhere he detected the faint scent of citrus. That afternoon, he delivered Sadako's remains to Takashi Yamamura without incident. He'd just returned from a fishing voyage, and as soon as he saw the black wrap bundle, he seemed to know what it was. Asakawa held it out in both hands and said, These are Sadako's remains. Takashi gazed at the bundle for a while, then narrowed his eyes tenderly. He shuffled over to Asakawa, bowed deeply, and accepted the bones, saying, Thank you for coming all this way. Asakawa was a bit taken aback. He hadn't thought the old man would accept it that easy. Takashi seemed to guess what he was thinking, and he said in a voice full of conviction, It's definitely Sadako. Up until the age of three, and then from age nine to eighteen, Sadako had lived here at the Yamamura estate. Takashi was sixty-one now. What exactly did she mean to him? Guessing from his expression as he received her remains, Asakawa imagined he must have loved her deeply. He didn't even ask for reassurance that this was Sadako. Perhaps he didn't need to. Perhaps he knew intuitively it was her inside the black cloth. The way his eyes had flashed when he'd first seen the bundle attested to that. There must have been some sort of power at work here, too. Having completed his errand, Asakawa wanted to get away from Sadako as quickly as possible. So he beat a hasty retreat, lying that I'll miss my flight if I don't leave now. If the family changed their minds and suddenly decided they wouldn't accept the remains as Sadako's without proof, all hope would be lost. If they started asking him for details, he didn't know what to say. It would be a long time before he'd be able to tell anyone the whole story. He particularly didn't feel like telling her relatives. Asakawa stopped by Hayatsu's bureau to say thanks for all his help the other day and then headed for the Oshima Hot Springs Hotel. He wanted to soak away all his fatigue in a hot bath and then write up the whole sequence of events. Chapter 3 Just about the time Asakawa was settling into his bed at Oshima Hot Springs Hotel, Ryuji was dozing at his desk in his apartment. His lips rested on a half-written essay, his spittle smudging the dark blue ink. He was so tired that his hand still clutched his beloved Mont Blanc fountain pen. He hadn't switched over to a word processor yet. Suddenly, his shoulders jerked and his face contorted unnaturally. Ryuji leapt up. His back went ramrod straight and his eyes opened far wider than they usually did when he woke up. His eyes were normally slightly slanted and when they were wide open like this, he looked different. His eyes were bloodshot. He'd been dreaming. Ryuji, normally not afraid of anything, was shaking through and through. He couldn't remember the dream, but the tautness of his body and his trembling bore witness to the terror of the dream. He couldn't breathe. He looked at the clock, 9.40. He couldn't immediately figure out the significance of the time. The lights were on, the overhead fluorescent bulb and the desk lamp in front of him, and there was plenty of light, but things still felt too dark. He felt an instinctual fear of the dark. His dream had been ruled by a darkness like no other. I'll be right down. Ryuji swiveled in his chair and looked at the video deck. The fateful tape was still in it. For some reason, he couldn't look away again. He kept staring at it. His breathing became rough. Misgiving showed on his face. Images raced through his mind, leaving no room for logical thought. Shit. You've come. He placed both hands on the edge of the desk and tried to figure out what was behind him. His apartment was in a quiet place just off a of main street, and all sorts of indistinct sounds came in from the street. Occasionally, the revving of an engine or the squeal of tires would stand out, but other than that, the sounds from outside were just a dull, solid mass stretching out behind him to the left and right. Pricking up his ears, he could figure out what was making some of the noises. Among them were the voices of insects. This mixed-up herd of sounds now started to float and flutter like a ghost. Reality seemed to recede. That was Ryuji's impression. And as reality receded, it left an empty space around him in which some sort of spirit matter hovered. The chilly night air and the moisture clinging to his skin turned into shadows and closed in on him. The beating of his heart grew faster, outstripping the ticking of the clock. 
The signs were pressing down on his chest. Ryuji looked again at the clock, 9.44. Every time he looked, he gulped. A week ago, when I watched that video at Asakawa's, what time was that? He said his brat always goes to sleep around 9. Assuming we hit play after that, we would have finished it. He couldn't figure out exactly when they'd finished watching the video, but he could tell the time was fast approaching. He was well aware that these indications were now closing in on him and were no counterfeit. This was different from when one's imagination magnified one's fears. There was no imaginary pregnancy. It was definitely coming steadily closer. What he didn't know was, why is it only coming for me? Why is it coming for me when it didn't come for Asakawa? It's not fair. His mind overflowed with confusion. What the hell's going on? Didn't we figure out the charm? So why? His chest was beating an alarm. It felt like something had reached inside his breast and was squeezing his heart. Pain shot through his spine. He felt a cool touch on his neck and startled. He tried to get up from his chair, but instead he was overcome by severe pain in his waist and back. He collapsed on the floor. Think, what should you do now? Somehow his remaining consciousness managed to give orders to his body. Stand, stand and think. Ryuji crawled over the floor mats to the video deck. He pushed eject and, and took out the tape. Why am I doing this? There was nothing else he could do but take a good long look at the tape that was behind everything. He looked at it back and front and went to put it back in the video deck, but stopped. There was a little title written on the label on the spine of the tape. Asakawa's handwriting. Liza Minnelli, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., 1989. It must have been some music program recorded on it before Asakawa had used it to dub that video. An electric jolt ran down his spine. A single thought swiftly took shape in his otherwise blank mind. Nonsense, he told himself, putting the thought from his mind. But when he turned the tape over, the momentary jolt changed to a certainty. Suddenly, Ryuji understood many things. The riddle of the charm, the old woman's prophecy, and another power hidden in the image on the tape. Why had those four kids in Villa Log Cabin run off without trying to carry out the charm? Why was Ryuji facing death when Asakawa's life had been spared? What had Sadako given birth to? The hint was right here, so close at hand. He hadn't realized Sadako's power had become fused with another power. She'd wanted to have a child, but her body couldn't bear one. So she'd made a bargain with the devil for lots of children. What effect is this going to have, Ryuji wondered. He laughed through his pain, an idiotic laugh. An ironic laugh. You've got to be kidding. I wanted to watch the end of mankind, and here I am in the vanguard. He crawled to the telephone and started to dial Asakawa's phone number, but then he remembered he was on Oshima. Son of a bitch will sure be surprised when he hears I'm dead. The terrific pressure in his chest made his ribs creak. He dialed Mai Takano's number. Ryuji wasn't sure whether it was a fierce attachment to life or a desire to hear her voice one last time, which had given rise to his impulse to summon Mai. He couldn't tell the difference anymore, but a voice came to him. Give it up. It wouldn't be right to get her mess messed up in this. But on the other hand, he still had a smidgen of hope. He might be in time. The clock on the desk caught his eye. 9.48. He put the receiver to his ear and waited for Mai to come to the phone. His head suddenly felt unbearably itchy. He put his hand to his head and scratched furiously and felt several strands of hair come out. On the second ring, Ryuji lifted his face. There was a horizontal mirror on the chest of drawers in front of him, and he could see his face reflected in it. Forgetting that he had the phone wedged between his shoulder and head, he brought his face close to the mirror. The receiver fell, but he didn't care. He just stared at his face in the mirror. Somebody else was reflected there. The cheeks were yellowish, dried, and cracked, and hair was falling out in clumps to reveal brown scabs. A hallucination. It's got to be a hallucination. He told himself. Even so, he couldn't control his emotions. A woman's voice came from the receiver where it lay on the floor. Hello? Hello? Ryuji couldn't stand it. He screamed. His screams overlapped with Mai's words, and in the end, he wasn't able to hear his beloved's voice. The face in the mirror was none other than his own a hundred years in the future. Even Ryuji hadn't known it would be so terrifying to meet himself, transformed into someone else. Mai Takano picked up the phone on the fourth ring and said hello. The only answer was a ghastly scream. A shudder came over the line. Fear itself came through the line from Ryuji's apartment to Mai's. Surprised, Mai held the receiver away from her ear. The moans continued. The first scream had been one of shock, and the subsequent moans held incredulity. She'd received harassing phone calls several times before, but she immediately realized this was different, and brought the phone back to her ear. The voice ceased. It was followed by dead silence. 9.49 p.m. His wish to hear the voice of the woman he loved one last time had been cruelly shattered. 
Instead, all he'd done was drown her in his death cries. Now he breathed his last. Nothingness enveloped his consciousness. Mai's words came again from the receiver near his hand. His legs were splayed out on the floor, his back against the bed, his left arm thrown back against the mattress. His right hand stretched out toward the receiver, which still whispered hello, and his head was bent backwards, eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. Just before he slipped into the void, Ryuji realized he wouldn't be saved, and he remembered to wish with all his might that he could teach that asshole Asakawa the secret of the videotape. Mai called hello, hello over and over again. No reply. She put the receiver back in the cradle. Those groans had sounded familiar. A premonition crept into her breast and she picked up the receiver again to dial her esteemed professor's phone number. She got a busy signal. She pressed down the hook with her finger and dialed again. Still busy. And she knew that it had been Ryuji calling and something horrible had happened to him. Chapter 4 October 20th, Saturday. He was happy to be home again at last, but with his wife and child gone, the place seemed lonely. How long it had been since he had been home? He tried to count on his fingers. He'd spent one night in Kamakura, got stuck on Oshima for two nights, spent the following night in Villa Log Cabin, and another night on Oshima. He'd only been away for five nights, but it felt as if he'd been gone from home for much longer. He often went away for four or five nights to research articles, but when he came home, it was always like the time had flown by. Asaka... Excuse me. Asakawa sat down at the desk in his study and turned on his word processor. His body still ached here and there, and his back hurt when he stood up or sat down. Even the ten hours he'd slept last night couldn't make up for all the sleepless nights of the last week. But he couldn't stop and rest now. If he didn't take care of the work that had piled up, he wouldn't be able to keep his promise to take them on a drive to Nico tomorrow, Sunday. He sat right down in front of the word processor. He'd already saved the first half of the report on a floppy disk. Now he needed to add the rest, everything that had happened since Monday, when they'd learned the name of Sadako Yamamura. He wanted to finish this document as quickly as possible. By dinner time, he'd written five pages. It was a pretty good pace. The speed of Asakawa's writing usually picked up as the night wore on. At any rate, he'd be able to relax and enjoy seeing his wife and daughter tomorrow. Then on Monday, he'd go back to his normal life. He couldn't predict how his editor would react to what he was writing now, but he'd never know until he finished writing it. Knowing it was probably fruitless effort, Asakawa went through and put the events of the second half of the week in order. Only when the manuscript was finished would he feel the episode was really and truly over. Sometimes his fingers stopped over the keyboard. The printout containing Sadako's photo was sitting by the desk. He felt as if that terrifyingly beautiful girl were watching him, and it ruined his concentration. He'd seen the same thing she'd seen, through those beautiful eyes. He still had the feeling part of her had entered into his body. Asakawa put the photo out of sight. He couldn't work with Sadako staring at him. He ate dinner at a local diner, then suddenly wondered what Ryuji was doing right now. He wasn't really worried. Somehow he just remembered Ryuji's face. And as he went back to his room and continued working, that face floated at the edge of his consciousness, gradually becoming clearer. I wonder what he's up to right now. His mental image of Ryuji's face drifted in and out of focus. He felt strangely agitated and reached out for the phone. After seven rings, he heard the receiver being picked up, and he felt relieved, but it was a woman's voice he heard. Hello? The voice was faint and thin. Asakawa had heard it before. Hello, this is Asakawa. Yes, came the faint reply. Ah, you must be my Takano, right? I should thank you for the lunch you made the last time we met. Don't mention it, she whispered and waited. Is Ryuji there? Asakawa wondered why she didn't just turn the phone over to Ryuji right away. The professor's dead. What? How long was he speechless? All he could say stupidly was what? His eyes stared blankly at a point in the ceiling. Finally, when the phone felt ready to slip from his hands, he managed to ask when. Last night, around ten o'clock. Ryuji had finished watching the video at Asakawa's condominium last Friday night at 9.49. He died right on schedule. What was the cause of death? He didn't need to ask. Sudden heart failure, but they haven't determined an exact cause of death. Asakawa barely managed to stay on his feet. This wasn't over. They'd just entered the second round. Mai, are you going to be there for a while? Yes, I need to put the professor's papers in order. I'll be over right away. Wait for me. Asakawa hung up the phone and sank to the floor. His wife and daughter's deadline was tomorrow morning at 11, another race against time. And this time, he was alone in the fight. Ryuji was gone. He couldn't stay on the floor like this. He had to take action, quickly, right now. 
He stepped out onto the street and gauged the traffic situation. It looked like driving would be faster than taking the train. He crossed at the crossing and climbed into the rental car, parked at the curb. He was glad he'd extended the rental another day so he could pick up his family. What did this mean? Hands gripping the wheel, he tried to get his thoughts together. Scene after scene flashed back to him, but none of them made sense. The more he thought, the less his mind could absorb, and the thread connecting events got more and more tangled until it seemed ready to snap. Calm down, calm down, and think, he lectured himself. Finally, he realized what he had to focus on. First of all, we didn't really figure out the charm, the way to escape death. Sadako didn't want her bones to be found and laid to rest. She wanted something entirely different. What? What is it? Why am I still alive if we didn't figure out the charm? What does that mean? Why did only I survive? At 11 o'clock next morning, Shizu and Yoko would face their deadline. It was already 9 at night. If he didn't do something, he'd lose them. He'd been thinking of this from the perspective of a curse pronounced by Sadako, a woman who'd met an unexpected death. But he began to doubt that approach now. He had a premonition of a bottomless evil, sneering at human suffering. Mai was kneeling formally in the Japanese-style room with an unpublished manuscript of Ryuji's on her lap. She was turning the pages, casting her eyes over each one, but it was a difficult subject at the best of times, and now nothing was sinking in. The room felt cavernous. Ryuji's parents had picked up his body early this morning and taken it back home to Kawasaki. He was gone. Tell me everything about last night. His friend was dead. Ryuji was like a brother-in-arms to him. He grieved, but he hadn't time now to wallow in sentiment. Asakawa sat next to Mai and bowed. It was after 9.30 at night. I got a call from the professor. She told him the details. The scream that had come from the phone, the silence that had followed. Then when she'd rushed to Ryuji's apartment, she'd found him leaning against the bed, legs spread wide. She fixed her gaze on the spot where Ryuji's corpse had been, and as she described the scene, tears came to her eyes. I called and called, but the professor didn't respond. Asakawa didn't give her time to cry. Was there anything different about the room? No. She shook her head. Only that the telephone was off the hook and making an ear-splitting sound. At the moment of death, Ryuji had called Mai. Why? Asakawa pressed further. He didn't tell you anything at the end. No last words. Nothing about a videotape. A videotape? Mai's expression showed she couldn't see any possible connection between her professor's death and a videotape. There was no way for Asakawa to know whether or not Ryuji had figured out the true nature of the tarm, charm before he died. But why did he call Mai? He must have done it knowing his death was at hand. Was it just that he wanted to hear a loved one's voice? Isn't it possible he figured out the charm and needed her help carrying it out? And that's why he called her. In which case it takes another person to make the charm work. Asakawa started to leave. Mai walked him to the door. Mai, will you be staying here tonight? Yes, I need to take care of his manuscript. Well, I'm sorry to have bothered you when you're so busy. Uh, he went to leave. Um, yes? Mr. Asakawa, I'm afraid you have the wrong ideas about the professor and me. What do you mean? You think we were having a relationship as a man and a woman? No, well, I mean... Mai could spot a man who thought they were lovers, the way he looked at them. Asakawa looked at them that way. It bothered Mai. The first time I met you, the professor introduced you as his best friend. That surprised me. I'd never heard the professor talk like that about anyone before. I think you were special to him, so... So I wish you could understand him a little better, as his best friend. The professor, as far as I know, he never knew a woman. She lowered her eyes. You mean he died a virgin? Asakawa had nothing to say to that. He remained quiet. The Ryuji that Mai remembered sounded like a completely different person from the one he knew. Were they talking about the same man? But... But don't you know what he did in high school? Was what he wanted to say, but he stopped himself. He had no desire to dredge up a dead man's crimes, and he didn't feel like destroying Mai's image of Ryuji. Not only that, he found himself with new doubts. Asakawa believed in a woman's intuition. Mai seemed to have been pretty close to Ryuji, and if he's, she said he was a virgin, he had to consider it a credible theory. In other words, maybe the whole thing about assaulting a college girl in his neighborhood had been nothing more than fiction. The professor was like a child when he was with me. He told me everything. He didn't hide anything. I know almost everything there is to know about his youth, his pain. Is that so? was all Asakawa could say in response. When he was with me, he was as innocent as a ten-year-old boy. When there was a third person around, he was the gentleman, and with you, I imagine, he played the scoundrel. Am I right? If he hadn't... Mai softly reached out for her white handbag, took out a handkerchief, and dabbed at her eyes. If he hadn't put on an air like that, he would never have been able to get on in the world. Do you see what I'm saying? Can you understand that? Asakawa was shocked. 
more than anything. But then something struck him. For a guy who'd been good at his studies and excellent at sports, Ryuji had been quite a loner. He hadn't had one close friend. He was so pure, not superficial like those jerks I go to school with. They couldn't compare to him. Mai's handkerchief was soaked with tears by now. Standing in the doorway, Asakawa found he had too much to think about to be able to come up with any suitable words to leave with Mai. The image of the Ryuji he'd known diverged completely from the one Mai had. His view of the man had become so unfocused now as to be unrecognizable. There was a darkness concealed within Ryuji. No matter how he struggled, Asakawa couldn't completely gasp his personality. Had he really assaulted the girl in high school? Asakawa had no way of knowing, nor whether he continued doing things like that. And right now, with his family's deadline coming tomorrow, Asakawa really didn't want to worry about anything else. So all he said was, Ryuji was my best friend too. The words must have pleased Mai. Her adorable face broke into an expression that could have been a smile or could have been more weeping, and she bowed ever so slightly. Asakawa shut the door and hurried downstairs. As he emerged onto the street and put distance between himself and Ryuji's apartment, he was suddenly overcome by the thought of this friend who'd thrown everything into this dangerous game, even sacrificing his life. Asakawa didn't bother to wipe away the tears. Chapter 5 October 21st, Sunday Midnight passed, and Sunday finally arrived. Asakawa was making notes on a sheet of paper, trying to get his thoughts in order. Just before his death, Ryuji figured out the charm. He telephoned Mai, possibly to summon her, which means he needed Mai's help to work the charm. Okay, the important question here is, why am I still alive? There's only one possible answer. At some point during the week, without knowing it, I must have carried out the charm. What other explanation is there? The charm must be something anybody can do with the help of another person. But that brought up another problem. Why did those four kids run out without performing it? If it was that easy, why couldn't at least one of them have played tough when they were together and gone and done it in secret later? Think, what did I do this week? What did I do that Ryuji didn't do? Asakawa let out a yell. How the hell am I supposed to know? There must have been a thousand things I did this week he didn't do. This isn't funny! He punched Sadako's photo. Damn you! How long are you going to keep torturing me? He hit her in the face over and over. But Sadako's expression never changed. Her beauty never diminished. He went into the kitchen and splashed some whiskey into a glass. All the blood had rushed to a single point in his head and he needed to disperse it. He went to knock it back in one gulp but stopped. He might come up with the answer tonight and have to drive to Ashikaga in the middle of the night, so maybe he'd better not drink. He was mad at the way he'd always tried to rely on something outside himself. When he'd had to dig Sadako's bones out from under the cabin, he'd given in to fear and nearly lost himself. It was only because he had Ryuji with him he'd been able to do what he needed. Ryuji! Hey, Ryuji! I'm begging you! Help me out here! He knew he'd never be able to go on without his life, wife and daughter. Never. Ryuji, lend me your strength. Why am I alive? Is it because I was the one to find Sadako's remains first? If so, there's no way to save my family. That can't be right, can it? Ryuji! He was devastated. He knew it was no time to be wailing, but he'd lost his cool. After moaning to Ryuji for a while, his calm returned. He started making notes again on the paper. The old woman's prophecy. Did Sadako really have a baby? Just before her death, she had sex with the last smallpox victim in Japan. Does that relate somehow? All his notes ended with question marks. Nothing was certain. Was this going to lead him to the charm? He couldn't afford to fail. Several more hours elapsed. It was beginning to get light outside. Lying on the floor, Asakawa could hear the sound of a man's breathing. Birds chirped. He didn't know if he was awake or dreaming. Somehow he'd wound up on the floor asleep. He squinted against the bright morning light. The figure of a man was slowly fading in the soft light. He wasn't scared. Asakawa came to himself with a start and stared hard in the direction of the figure. Ryuji, is that you? The figure didn't reply, but suddenly the title of a book came to Asakawa, so vividly that it might have been branded into the wrinkles of his brain. Epidemics and Man. The title appeared in white on the back of his eyelids when he closed his eyes, then disappeared, but it still echoed in his head. That book should be in Asakawa's study. When he first started to investigate the case, Asakawa had wondered if it could have been a virus that caused four people to die all simultaneously. He'd brought the book then. He hadn't read it, but he remembered putting it away on a bookshelf. Sun was streaming in through the eastern windows falling on him. He tried to stand up. His head throbbed. Was it a dream? He opened the door to his study. He took down the book that whatever whoever it was had suggested to him, Epidemics and Man. Of course, Asakawa had a pretty good idea who it was that had made the suggestion. Ryuji. 
He'd return for a brief moment to teach him the secret of the charm. So where in this 300-page tome did the answer lie? Asakawa had another flash of intuition. Page 191. The number was insinuated into his brain, though not quite as searingly as the last time. He opened the page. A single word jumped out at him, and pulsed bigger and bigger. Reproduction. 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 A virus's instinct is to reproduce. A virus usurps living structures in order to reproduce itself. <gasps> Asakawa groaned. He'd finally grasped the nature of the charm. It's obvious what I did this week and Ryuji didn't. I brought the tape home, made a copy, and showed it to Ryuji. The charm is simple. Anybody can do it. Make a copy and show it to somebody. Help it reproduce by showing it to somebody that hasn't seen it. Those four kids were happy with their prank and stupidly left the tape in the cabin. Nobody went to the effort of going all the way back for it so they could actually perform the charm. No matter how he thought about it, that was the only possible interpretation. He picked up the phone and dialed Ashikaga. Shuzu answered. Listen to me. Listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you. There's something I need your mother and father to see right away. I'm on my way now, so don't let them go anywhere before I get there. Do you understand? This is incredibly important. Ugh, am I selling my soul to the devil? In order to save my wife and daughter, I'm willing to put my wife's parents in danger, even if it's only temporarily. But if it'll save their daughter and granddaughter, I'm sure they'll cooperate. All they have to do is make copies and show them to somebody else, and they'll be out of danger. But after that, what then? What's this all about? I don't understand. Just do as I say. I'm leaving right now. Oh, right. They have a video deck, don't they? Yes. Beta or VHS? VHS. Great, I'm on my way. Don't. I repeat, don't go anywhere. Hold on a minute. What you want to show my mom and dad is that video, isn't it? He didn't know what to say, so he shut up. Right. Right? It's not dangerous? Dangerous. You and your daughter are going to be dead in five hours. Give me a break, damn it. Just stop asking so many questions. I don't have time to explain it all to you from the beginning anymore. Asakawa wanted to shout at her, but he managed to restrain himself. Just do as I say. It was just before seven. If he raced there on the freeway, provided there were no traffic delays, he should get to his in-law's house in Ashikaga by 9.30. Factoring in the time it would take to make a copy for his wife and another for his daughter, they should just make the 11 o'clock deadline. He hung up and opened the doors to the entertainment center and unplugged the video deck. They needed two decks to make copies, so he had to take one of his. As he left, he took one more look at the photo of Sadako. You sure gave birth to something nasty. It, he took the oi ramp onto the freeway, deciding to skirt Tokyo Bay and get on the Tohoku Highway headed out of town. There wouldn't be much traffic on the Tohoku Highway. The problem was how to avoid congestion before that. As he paid the toll on the on-ramp and peered at the traffic information board, he realized for the first time it was Sunday morning. As a result, there were hardly any cars in the tunnel under the bay, where they were usually lined up like the beads on a rosary. There weren't even any jams in the big merging areas. At this rate, he'd get to Ashikaga right on schedule, with plenty of time to start making copies of the video. Asakawa eased up on the accelerator. Now he's more afraid of going too fast and getting into an accident. He sped north along the Sumida River. Glancing down, he could see neighborhoods just walk waking up on a Sunday afternoon. People were walking around with a different air than on weekday mornings. A peaceful Sunday morning. He couldn't help but wonder, what effect is this going to have? With my wife's copy and my daughter's copy, this virus is going to be set free in two directions. How's it going to spread from there? He could imagine people making copies and passing them on to people who'd already seen it before, trying to keep the thing contained within a limited circle so it wouldn't spread. But that would be going against the virus's will to reproduce. There was no way of knowing yet how that function was incorporated into the video. That would take experimenting, and it would probably be impossible to find anybody willing to risk their life to find the truth of it until it had spread pretty far and things had become quite serious. It really wasn't very difficult to make a copy and show it to someone, so that's what people would do. As the secret traveled by word of mouth, it would be added to. You have to show it to someone who hasn't seen it before. And as the tape propagated, the week's lag time would probably be shortened. People who were shown the tape wouldn't wake a week to make a copy and show it to someone else. How far would this ring expand? People would be driven by an instinctual fear of the disease, and this pestilential videotape would no doubt spread throughout society in the blink of an eye. And driven by rumors, people would start to spread crazy rumors. Uh, such as, once you've seen it, you have to at least make two copies, show them to two different people. It'd turn into a pyramid scheme, spreading incomparably faster than it would at one tape at a time. In the space of half a year, everybody in Japan would have become a carrier, and the infection would spread overseas. In the process, of course, several people would die, and people would realize the tape's warnings weren't a lie, and they'd start making copies more desperately. 
there would be a panic. Where would it end? How many victims would this claim? Two years ago, during the boom and in interest of the occult, the newsroom had received 10 million subscription submissions. Something had gone haywire, and it would happen again, allowing the new virus to run rampant. A woman's resentment towards the masses who had hounded her father and mother to their deaths, and the smallpox virus's resentment towards the human ingenuity that had driven it to the brink of extinction, had fused together in the body of a singular person named Sadako Yamamura, and had reappeared in the world in an unexpected, unimagined form. Asakawa, his family, everybody who had seen the video, they'd been subconsciously infected with this virus. They were carriers, and viruses borrowed directly, burrowed directly into the genes, the core of life. There was no telling yet what would result from this, how it would change human history, human evolution. In order to protect my family, I'm about to let loose on the world a plague which could destroy all mankind. Asakawa was frightened by the essence of what he was trying to do. A voice was whispering to him. If I let my wife and daughter die, it'll end right here. If a virus loses its host, it'll die. I can save mankind. But the voice was too quiet. He entered the Tohoku Highway. No congestion. If he kept going, he'd be there in plenty of time. Asakawa drove with his arms taut and both hands clutching the wheel. I won't regret it. My family has no obligation to sacrifice themselves. There are some things you just have to protect when they're threatened. He spoke loud enough to be heard over the engine to renew his determination. If he were Ryuji, what would he do? He felt sure he knew. Ryuji's spirit had taught him the secret of the video. It was practically telling him to save his family. That gave him courage. He knew what Ryuji would probably say. Be true to what you're feeling this instant. All we have in front of us is an uncertain future. The future will take care of itself. When humanity gets around to applying its ingenuity, who knows if it won't find a solution? It's just another trial for the human species. In every age, the devil reappears in a different guise. You can stamp it out and stamp it out, and he'll keep coming back over and over. Ashikawa took his, kept his foot steady on the accelerator, and the car pointed toward Ashikaga. In his rearview mirror, he could see the skies over Tokyo receding into the distance. Black clouds moved eerily across the skies. They slithered like serpents, hinting at the unleashing of some apocalyptic evil. The end. Or is it? Dun dun dun! Thanks for joining us. It is a lovely story. Uh, if you want to call it that. I like the twists and turns this had. I'd only read about halfway, so the last half was a surprise to me. Um, much darker, I think, in some ways than the film. The film, I think, almost goes more supernatural with it. Like, they die of real fear of the ghost coming out at them. In the book, it's just kind of a horrible heart attack. But, of course, the book is going for more of a viral, uh, direction. It kind of explores things in a way that the films, the films kind of miss. Um, I don't know. I, I'm going to have to process this thing about this book. It was very good. I'm really glad I read it. And, of course, uh, Sadako is our um, trans hero. Kill all the horrible men. Kill them all. I'm, I'm mad that the guy that killed her is still alive. I want him to die in the future, please. <laughs> please make him die in the future. We will definitely read more of these books. We may take a break. Um, I really would like to read to y'all uh, Demon City Shinjuku, which is the first book that Hideyuki Kikuchi ever read, wrote. I love it. It's really good, and it's not too long. Um, I really want to share that with y'all. Uh, we also finished The Silmarillion. That one is Fridays. Uh, I will let members pick probably what book that will be. So then we'll be reading Heaven Official's Blessing, Scum Villain, uh, Demon City, and something that members pick. Uh, we'll come back to both Tolkien and The Ring eventually. Sadako ain't innocent. Shh! I'm always rooting for the monsters. Y'all know this. Sadako, kill them. Get them. They deserve it. Get it. <laughs> There's so few likable characters in this book that I am. I'm just like, get them! <laughs> like, I do like that at the end they make it a little less clear. Like, the, the it, it feels very apt to compare Ryuji to Vincent because he is so much a character of just talking, just words. Did he do all those horrible things? We don't know. But his words are so cruel and, you know, he's so untrustworthy, you know? Like, it's so hard to know if what he's saying is real or not, if he did these horrible things or not. But either way, he's led people to believe he has, and he does it to mess with them, I feel like. So very a very Vincent-type character, and I do like that it's so ambiguous that we can't know for sure who, what he really is, what he really did. Um, 
I I have thoughts on this book. Uh, that's, that's very interesting, very fun. Uh, last thing of today, since that did take like three hours and my voice is dead. Um, be back tomorrow with normal schedule stuff. And uh, yeah, thanks again to all our members. Jeff, Billy, Delvin, all you folks supporting the channel. Thanks so much. If you want to support the channel and get cool bonus content for doing it, now's the best time. Uh, there's more than like a hundred behind the scene videos now. I've kind of taken a bunch of stuff that was much older that I didn't really want to delete, but I didn't want representing the channel and I've thrown them into the members only stuff. Lots of like my first streams I ever did, you know, very old symbolism videos, a uh, bunch of stuff like that. And I'm going to be adding some other things as well. More poetry readings. Um, oh yeah, the, okay, she did murder some teens, this is fair, she did do some teen murders. Hey, we never got to know those teens, maybe they were horrible, evil, murdering teens. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I'm gonna run and take, have dinner, I'm hungry and tired, so I'm gonna go crash. Thanks again for listening, and I will see you guys next time, bye!